It's been called the road to Alaska. But it's so much more than that. It's a dream. A life purpose. A destination unlike any other. It's a dedication to the craft. The same aspect. To the culture. To the journey. The best all-around snowboarders in the world have gathered here, in this remote and foreboding landscape, to fulfill a calling that we all share. To draw lines down the faces of mountains. And to stand above the rest at the end of the road. This is Alaska, and this is the final stop of the 2022 Natural Selection Tour. Kicking it off. Welcome to the Alaskan backcountry for the third and final stop on the Yeti Natural Selection Tour. We have eight of the world's best men and four of the world's best women ready to throw down. My name's Ed Lee and I'm joined in the booth today by Mary Walsh. Mary, everything is aligned here for a perfect final. Yes, we have arrived in Alaska, the culmination of this entire tour for this entire season and conditions are prime. 60 centimeters, two feet of fresh snow up here. And you look at park and pipe riders, you have the raw talent, but they're pre-rehearsed, rote runs. It's essentially like going to the zoo. What we have here are the apex predators of snowboarding, and we are watching them in the wild. The stage is set for one of the most breathtaking competitions in all of snowboarding. these peaks in Alaska, the riders immerse themselves completely in the backcountry, oh, yeah. spending four days in a remote base camp. We are packed up and ready to camp. And you can see how they access this zone was these very traditional mode of transportation in Alaska, these fixed wings, airplanes, otters and beavers used to transport everything and everyone to the glacier. Yeah, in Alaska, they're essentially like buses, aren't they? So the runway, you can see there's almost like the bus stop, unloading skidoos onto the glacier as well. That give all of the crew and the riders a real sense of autonomy out there. They could actually move around and get between venues without using helicopters all the time. And this was a full functioning base camp. This is the likes of what you would kind of see in like an Everest situation. And like all civilized situations, there was a fully functioning bar. And you can see the planet Earth flag there as well. This venue was stunning. This is the bar in full effect, and Pacifico is getting sunk there for sure. The Coyote Cantina, I believe, nestled underground beneath the snow, still on a very massive layer of snowpack. Yeah, and the big Agnes tents there as well, looking after everyone, keeping them warm. And living up on the glacier like this gives the riders a real connection with the snowpack. Okay, let's take a look back over the last two stops of the tour. And we started at the Yeti Natural Selection in Jackson Hole. And this was one for the more freestyle orientated riders, wasn't it, Mary? Yes, Jackson Hole really celebrates that naturally enhanced terrain, the interplay of the man-made features with this area of this incredible Teton resort. And it's one of the shallower faces as well, so speed control isn't quite so much of an issue. 
Yes, and you can see this year at Jackson, we didn't have that deep snow that we had in 2021. So a lot of this was navigating the conditions and that interplay with mother nature. So Sage Kotzenberg taking out the win with a consummate display. And Elena Haidt was the champion on the women's side. Then over to the TAE natural selection in bald face and Scary Cherry is the venue and it had much, much stronger snow conditions than Jackson Hole, but still it wasn't the bottomless snow that the riders were hoping for. I mean, this was the triumphant return to Scary Cherry from the last time it was competed on was in 2013. And I think the energy from the riders to return to this venue was palpable. Travis Rice with beautiful corked back seven nose grab. Mikel Bang with his signature backside 540. In the end, it was Dustin Craven and his immaculate switch game that won the day for the men. And of course, Zoe Sadowski Sinnott returned from the Olympics to join the tour and emerge victorious on the women's side. Okay, let's take a look at the overall standings. Consistency is the key word for Mikkel Bang. Dustin Craven and Sage Kotzenberg, the two stop winners so far. And then the two rookies. Can you believe we say that about Torstein Horgmo and Jared Elston looking very, very strong? Almost all of the men are in with a shot at winning here. And on the women's side, Elena Haidt, after winning in Jackson and second in Baldface, sits in that top spot. All she has to do to take the overall tour is make it into finals. But Zoe sadowski Sinet and Marion Erdy are not going to let that happen easy. Both of them are within contention if Elena lands in the fourth spot. Now, the NFTs. If you don't quite understand them, non-fungible tokens offer digital copyright on images and exclusive offers. And essentially, it's a way of buying a membership into the natural selection community. It gives you access, in this case, with Alaska to, if you've got the NFT with the course preview, then you also get the drone footage that the riders are using to scope this course when it was released to the riders. So an early preview of the course. And there's plenty of other tangible benefits as well, Mary. That's what makes NFTs, I think, very exciting for natural selection. I mean, one big example is, of course, the Golden Snow Cat winner Biscuit who through his NFT purchase was able to join the crew in Baldface after winning that golden snowcat ticket and spend the week there with them that's a pretty incredible once in a lifetime experience yeah it's Willy Wonka for snowboarding isn't it yes completely if you want to join the community head over to the website where you'll find a limited and a legendary NFT release today now let's get into the parameters which are going to shape today's competition and we'll kick off with the weather brought to you by Oakley and Mary, I think it's fair to say conditions are nothing short of perfect. They're going to need their prism lenses. Yes, and with 60 centimeters or two feet of settled fresh snow, Travis Rice himself has said it does not get better in Alaska than this. Yeah, riding conditions are perfect. Temperatures there, minus 10 degrees Celsius, 14 Fahrenheit. A little cold for camping. This is the format, though. We've got quarterfinals, semifinals, finals. Eight riders in three rounds. They're going head to head. The highest score from either of the runs is what will take you through. There are no tiebreakers. In the women's format, it's a little bit shorter, but no less intense. Yes, the women, of course, we have four riders and they're gonna go straight into two heats of semifinals and into a final. It is head to head. Again, there are no tiebreakers here in Alaska. The highest score will advance. And that means I think we're gonna see the riders really pushing hard. You, you can't lay up on any of these runs. No, I don't think you can lay up in Alaska. <laughs> okay, let's take a look at the judging criteria. We're using Credo again, which was introduced in Baldface, starting off with creativity. So that's about opening new terrain, the variety of tricks and comboing and linking tricks and lines together. You've got the risk, you've got the execution, difficulty, and of course, the overall in there. Right, what stands out to you in these brackets? I mean, every single one looks like a final, Mary. I mean, of course, we do have a repeat of the 2021 finals here in AK with the first one up, Mikkel versus Ben. I mean, that's going to be very exciting. Then age versus experience in Jared versus Travis. Totally, and a battle of the Canadians, Mark McMorris, Dustin Craven, two riders from opposite ends of the spectrum coming together. And then real freestyle heads in Torstein versus Sage. And then in the women's, same as the men's, all killer, no filler. Age versus experience again with Hannah versus Zoe. And then, of course, with Marion versus Elena, Marion had punched her ticket last year to come to Alaska. Travel restrictions kept her away, and now she's back. So exciting. And Elena, of course, has been on one this year. OK, quick break. When we come back, we've got men's quarterfinals. Get 
come, Ben. What's Ben got to do? He knows he's got to step it up. All right, little wheelie, but it, his momentum is still carrying the projector forward. Boom. Wow. Say hello to my little method friend. Always excited to see a Ferg method. Yeah, it doesn't get old. I mean, he had such a solid run last run, he just bobbled on that uh, back three, so. Oh. oh, stepping that up. How's that landing? Wow. Hmm. Got ourselves a battle. And there we go. Bolts. A little back three, gotten away, and uh, answering back to Mickle right now. And I love how he comes out of every trick just powering down the mountain with these big old speed carbs into these setups. I love this little cross court air, too, that he's found there. It's a clean run. It's a great run. Will it be enough? I... Yeah, as you said that, I'm just sitting here trying to recover from that backside by 40 of Mickle Bang, which I know isn't the entire run, but between that and and that three, ooh. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's perfect, right? He's built upon his first run, he stomped a run that he's obviously, look, look at him jump around for joy, he's happy with that run. <laughs> Welcome back to the Yeti Natural Selection here in Alaska on the little beaver fixed wing planes, which has given us access to the glacier. And then there's heli access from the base camp up to the top of Montrachet. If you've got a good memory, you'll know that that was the venue for the semi-finals in 2021. This year, this giant pyramid has been split into two. On the lookers right hand side, as we look at this big face, we've got the men's quarterfinals and the, men, and the women's semi-finals. Then on the lookers left hand side, we'll see the men's semi-finals. And this is a classic Alaskan face, Mary. Yes, you can see that because of these prolific spines that run the entire area of this zone, those are what you come to ride in Alaska. That is such what this terrain is. Okay, let's take a closer look with the GoPro course preview. We can make our way up here. And this is a perfect example of a spine running down from the peak. And it, you said it, it's the quintessential Alaskan experience because the snow builds up on these spines and it creates what Tom Burke calls the bowling ball effect. As you ride onto them, you're going in completely blind. So you need to know exactly where you are on that face if you're gonna leap off any of these features with confidence. All the riders have been studying drone footage shot by the GoPro Hero 10 with, of course, that new Enduro battery that is so good in the cold. And it really comes down to being able to take that knowledge onto the hill so that when you're riding, you can really tell where you are. It's that combination and play of experience and preparation. So the peak is at just shy of 3,800 feet or 1,150 meters. Uh, you've got 335 or 1,100 feet of vertical with a maximum gradient of 38 degrees. So it's not in that Selassnek, Burke, Kevin Jones style of crazy exposure, but it's still very, very punchy. And standing down in the valley is the third member of our team, Tom Tebert Monteroso. Let's check in with Tom right now. All right, here we are. We are standing on the Pino Glacier behind me, the Montrachet Spines, where men's quarterfinals and women's semifinals is about to go down up here in Alaska. Now, while this is the venue, you may be wondering what our accommodations are. Come with me, I'll show you real quick. As the riders are bumping up to the top to get ready, here at the Natural Selection, that right there is base camp. We're living in tents. We are living Alaska. We got glacier glasses, we got harnesses, beacons are on, and we are ready to go for men's quarterfinals and women's semifinals up in Alaska. Let's make our way to the top of Montrachet now for the first of our quarterfinals, and it is a rematch for Ben Ferguson and Mikkel Bang of the Yeti Natural Selection 2021 Alaska final. Two of the most experienced riders in Alaskan terrain. And it is that whopping lump of Norwegian timber, Mikkel Bang, who's gonna go first. Six foot two, he's riding a 170 Burton Custom, and he knows what he wants to do here. 
Yeah, I think coming in here, you know, winning last year, and then, you know, people definitely are like, all right, champ is back. You got to defend the title. And then you're just like, oh, <laughs> okay. Gotta, gotta do my best, you know? So it's definitely a little bit more pressure, you know? People's got, people got their eyes on me, you know? But uh, whatever happens, happens. We're here to have a good time and snowboard, and uh, we're gonna have a good time regardless. Baldface and Jackson, you kind of have this like, like one venue right there, but Alaska is like the mountain kind of wraps around things. You might be looking at something and it, it shrinks or it just gets bigger. So it's kind of, it's a little bit harder here. You know, you, you can only see photos and you can only like fly around to look at it and scope. Um, so you definitely, it's, it's harder in Alaska. You know, to choose a line. Well, yeah, Burton. Burton has become kind of like my family. Uh, they uh, they really do care about their riders, and they really care about the snowboarding community. And uh, yeah, being a part of Burton is just uh, it's a blessing for sure. Burton, of course, the official hard goods sponsor of the entire tour this year. And Mickel's been a part of the Burton family since he was in grade school. Yeah. And he's been cranking results since 2002, video parts since 2003. And now he is at the top of the natural selection tree, reigning Alaskan champion, dropping into the face, the first man to open up Montrachet. Mikkel, of course, has just such fluid style. He really interacts with ter the terrain in a very natural way. I mean, he almost makes it look easy when we know this terrain is incredibly not that way. And this snow is absolutely perfect. The first glimpse of it getting ridden, and he comes up to his first feature, tucks away a nose bone there, into a front side three nose bone. He puts it down perfectly. I mean, this is a phenomenal way to open up this semifinals riding right now. And I always feel with Mikel, it's, it's as if he knows how to measure his runs and build steadily with them. He always does his own thing on the face. He's not looking at what other people are doing. He's following his own cues. I completely agree. We saw that in Jackson uh, the last two years. We saw that in Baldface. He's constantly building upon the beta that he gets every time he drops in. So he's got right into the gut in between spine four and five there. Coming up high. Getting around for a bit of a butter three on that. Okay, and then that last feature, just a nice ollie there. So we know that the judges are gonna use this as an anchor. So the score that we see here is the tone that they're setting for the day. And it was, for me, there was a lot of intensity up at the top of that run, but then it just kind of drifted away a little in the guts of that shoot at the bottom. I agree. I think that it's a solid foundation, not only for the day, but oh, for man, Mikkel himself, fine. that he'll build upon in his second drop. And we always see that. He, t he puts a run down, it's almost like a range finder, and then he starts to push in that second run. That's an, a great way to put it. Okay, next up, standing next to that fluttering planet Earth flag, it's the man out of Bend, Oregon, a precision pipe rider, Ben Ferguson getting on tour and coming to all the stops and making it to Alaska is a, you know, feat in itself. So I'm hyped to be here. Definitely like this kind of terrain, like the big steep stuff. And I think I'll, I got a pretty good chance up there. So, I mean, it's crazy. It's this big, scary place and you're flying around in a helicopter and, you know, the, the whole thing is like nerve gripping, you know, kind of puckered up the whole time. Feel it in your stomach when the heli starts chopping around and, and then you're like competing on top of that. So that adds a whole nother like element to the nerves as well. Yeah, winning in Alaska, I think it would just be like the most badass thing you could do. You know, it's kind of like the the beefiest tour stop. It would be kind of the, you know, end all be all. You said it, Ed, Ben is one of the most experienced riders here in AK, but he's one of the younger riders too, only 26 years old. What's interesting, they're both on Burton as well. Mikel's on that custom, Ben opting for the one of the family tree line, the hometown hero. It's really aggressive taper on it. So it's definitely gonna limit his switch capability on this face, but he's coming in. Totally different intensity to Mikel. Like you can see the energy, the drive he's putting into this. Yeah, he was really energetic on that top section and then opening up this new rider's left area. 
Okay, and now he comes on. We called it before, that bowling ball section, and he's coming in with speed here. He knows where he is. And there's got to be the benefit of riding this face in 2021. Good, steep terrain, and you can see him working over this spine now. Ben really has that combination of power and playfulness, and I think it's it's very impressive to see that on his first drop, oh, heading toward that. A massive drop. Don't forget that the drone footage also kind of compresses things a little bit, that that is very big and even steeper than it looks to us. And that second drop there, straight off the nose. And he's right up on the end of that one. He has to get that speed right. He tranny finds perfectly. Wow. Beautiful backside 360. That was a phenomenal end to that run. I mean, that really capitalized on that second section of his line. <sighs> take a break. Let's take a breath and recap on this heat. So Mikel Bang, it felt like he came in at about gas mark four. It was really a middling run by Mikel's standards. Some really nice stuff in here. I think that was like testing out the snow, testing out the drop in. He was the, the first to go, opening up everything. I mean, of course, a beautiful 360 though, classic style from the Norwegian. That's bread and butter for him, but the door's open for Ben Ferguson. He's seen the snow, he knows what he wants here, and he really lets go. I mean, Ben really was kind of like, you know, unleashed the wild horses right on that run. He came out, with, like you said, with so much energy. And then this angle really shows you this impressive three drop that he did. And he managed to get that toe edge in perfectly. It would have been very easy to mess up that line and drop below it there with that gradient. And that beautiful transition landing. I mean, that was perfect. And then finishes it with that back three, floaty. Every, every landing we get here, we're getting more and more data on just how good this snow is. So last year's finalist here in Alaska. So taking a seat and waiting for the scores nice from Connor Manning up. and Sandy McDonald. Man, I, I spoke to Sandy McDonald earlier in the week and he said oh, really? judging without sight, without practice, is one yep. of the most terrifying Man, things he's right. ever done. And they're put on the spot. First run there with two very strong runs. Yeah, I don't envy the judges at all. They have their work cut out for them at every stop, especially this one. But uh, th that speaks to exactly what we saw. Ben Ferguson with the energy, with the tricks, oh, yeah. and with the exposure at the top of that run, taking out a 78 over Bang 70. So That thing is big. Yeah. <laughs> it definitely was, looked like, it. That was really, really sick. So, but we've seen this from Mikel before. He'll always range fine, and we'll expect to see that second run really ratcheted up. Now back up to the top, age versus experience. Jared Elston, the youngest man in the field at 23, going up against by far the most experienced Alaskan backcountry rider in snowboarding right now. It is the GOAT, Travis Rice. Now this is a rematch from the Jackson Hole stop where these two went head to head and Jared emerged victorious over Travis on his home turf. But now he's in the den of the lion, Alaska, with the man who has created this contest. Uh, my experience is nothing. I've never been to Alaska and I've never ridden anything like this. Yeah, I mean, I've been daydreaming about coming to Alaska for so long. So to finally get up here and like under these circumstances is dream come true for sure. Yeah, natural selection is totally different from all the other contests because it's like, all right, there's so many variables with like snow and terrain and everything and just like to have this contest pulled off in the way it is, is just like makes it completely unique to any other contest out there for sure. The thing that strikes you about Jared Elston though is that you watch him in Jackson Hole, when he went up against Travis, when he went up against Sage, he didn't seem to feel the pressure. He just, the pressure seems to create this incredible stoke, this energy in him, and he thrives off it, if anything. Oh yeah, Jared is a true ATV. He's part of this new breed of snowboarder that just tackles everything voraciously as we see him dropping in with, you know, fully hell for leather on this, into this Alaskan spine. Fantastic use of voraciously as well. Big vapor trail there as he pops off that first nose. Now he starts to get in above the exposure. The calm before the storm. as he's navigating that same kind of line that Ben took. Going a little more conservative, it looks like, on the side of the spine than Ben chose. A hundred percent, like these are beautiful turns, but he's burning vertical here. 
And you know, the judges have made it so clear in some of the big matchups. If you're laying up anywhere, if your run isn't super intense top to bottom, they're going to punish you for it. And this is a kind of dangerous place to be sitting because for him, this is one of his first ever runs, just dropping there. That was excellent. Um, but he's going against, you know, the mayor of Alaska right now. So he's got basically someone hot in his heels without even having dropped in before. Yeah, this is, for me, this is it's beautiful. It's the kind of snowboarding we all want to do, but on oh, lovely front three there at the bottom. But at the moment, this is a very, I'm going to go out and say it, it's a pretty pedestrian run. I think that, you know, plays to the fact that Jared has not been to Alaska before, as he said, and he's just trying to probably find his feet underneath him. And he's such a strong rider that you can see that confidence building at the end there with the back-to-back -back 360s. But is it going to be enough for what Travis is planning in his head and the gears turning up there to drop in right after him? And you, he wants to stay on his feet at this stage. He wants to get a feel for the slope. Can you imagine where his adrenaline levels are at at the moment? Oh, through the roof, out the ears right now. <laughs> OK, back up to the top. And this is the man we've all been waiting for, Travis Rice, the man whose concept has become reality in the shape of natural selection. He wasn't here last year. Let's find out what he makes of Alaska this year. To win an event up here with the rider field that is doing this event, um, I mean, it would be incredible. Uh, because that means that I would have ridden well. And I think that's everyone's goal coming up here um, is, you know, at the end of the day, it's like we all just, we all just want to ride well. We all want to ride to our best ability. So it would mean a lot, especially with the field of riders that are up here. Yeah, I mean, the magic of the industry alliance is it allows, you know, endemic brands that support snowboarding to also, you know, work with and collaborate with the natural selection tour. You know, for me especially, it's brands like Quicksilver, GoPro, Union, Boa, Yeti, and Libtech. Like those brands I have incredible partnerships with and they also support the tour. It's just a beautiful little symbiotic circle. A lot of people very, very surprised watching Natural Selection at just how competitive Travis Rice is. They haven't seen him in a bib. I remember him between 2002 and 2010. He was a ferocious competitor, and we're seeing the best of that come out in him again here at Natural Selection. And just look at how he charged that first hit on the top of the spine. I mean, this is his playground, this is his wheelhouse. Now we're finally getting to see him in the event that he has created in the terrain that he has chosen. And already you can see the difference in the speed and the confidence he's got in this kind of terrain. I just think the POV cam lines. <gasps> oh my God, massive backside 360. That was enormous. That was gigantic. Out of, straight out of the sea monster sized draw of gigantic oh, wow. or Leviathan, we should say. They're almost paddling his way across. He wants to make another feature now. And I was about to say, like, he'd got the big mounting credentials there, but we were missing the freestyle smart. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I was immediately thinking the dark matter lines and just that technical prowess. But, you know, he's the brains behind this. He knows the ethos of what he wants. This is, this is like we said, his playground was just a popping a casual looking, but not casual frontside 180. So setting up to cab five. Big cap five onto a beautiful transition, triples down the landing. Oh, and going down a little bit, but really taking advantage of the terrain. Really, you know, throughout every stop of this tour, we've seen Travis open up new lines and really kind of picking things apart. And that is, again, what we're seeing here now in AK. Yeah. You can hear the crowd at the bottom of this run cheering that one in. The intensity, and we said it at the top, the ferocity that he had there. Really, really worthy. stamping his mark on this competition. We're not what the? Dude, you are a goddamn psychopath. Ah! How the hell did you go over there? <laughs> Just continued brute mental strength is how he got over there. Jared Elston, we said it at the top, it was a little bit pedestrian, and in the face of Travis Rice's run, this does look a little bit soft. The thing that I think is very promising, though, about Jared's run is at the bottom, you could see him getting more comfortable. He had the back-to-back -back 360s. I feel that he is going to let loose 
a, a bunch more in his second run. That's just the kind of rider that he is. But you're looking at that front side 360. When we see Travis's back three in a minute, I think it, you're going to see that Travis's is two or three times the size yes. of that, at least. And he's kind of, he's, it's not a simple transfer over a ridge. He's clearing so much terrain with it. Oh yeah, Travis's run from top to bottom was an example of what the judges are looking for when it comes down to it. It was technical, his terrain choices. I mean, that was just absolutely massive. And pinpoint sniper landing. Look at the pop he gets off that. No grab, but still looks so good. It's Devon Walsh style all the way, isn't it? Then this front one, this is what judges want to see. A switch link, you're not reverting to set up a cab five. Instead, he's ridden a critical part of the face switch. That was honestly so technical. And that's when the credo comes into play that even though he had that fall at the bottom, the judges are going to be rewarding that overall appraisal of his run very highly. On the scale of things, I think this score's got to be mid to high 80s. I genuinely do. Is that gap is... <laughs> so Jared Elston Holy getting shit. schooled by Travis Rice. Let's see what the judges make of it. Elston knows that he's got to turn up for this second run. Otherwise, his Alaskan journey is going to be over before it begins. Travis, on the other hand, looks like he's on a mission today, doesn't he? Oh, there it is! 90 points, 90 first point. run. Oh, okay, cool. I was 90. gonna say, there's room to improve on that. <laughs> A man on a mission. I mean, this is a culmination too of much longer than oh, that just gap. this season. That gap, that's one of the best gaps I've ever hit. Wow, you heard it, you heard it right there. <sighs> Travis is ready to eat Alaska for breakfast. Back <laughs> up at the top, it is Mark McVoris versus Dustin Craven. An all Canadian battle, but two very, very different riders, Mary. Yeah, you don't get yeah, two yeah. ends of the spectrum more than these individuals. And of course here, the bit? man who is consummately incredible under pressure, regardless of terrain, Mark McMorris. Perfect, thanks, Dave. Obviously winning in Alaska would be insane. It's not necessarily Something I feel that is out of reach, but the more time you spend up here, the better chances you have. And I haven't spent a ton of time in Alaska yet, um, sort of building my credentials, if you will. Um, it, in due time, and it could be this time, it could be next time, I'm not sure, but uh, I'm gonna try and ride my best. I've, I've got to do a lot of neat things with Oakley and thankfully they're a part of the natural selection tour and a part of the industry alliance. and. It's uh, it's exciting for what, what the future holds. And then Burton, can't say enough good about Burton. Jake Burton was a great friend. They came on as a partner with me in 2011, I think. So just over a decade now, and it's been epic. The family, the Carpenters have done so much for snowboarding, and um, I feel very proud to ride for Burton, and they're, they're the the leader in our industry. Uh, they make unbelievable products and yeah, I'm just honored to be a part of that brand. The Saskatchewan snowboarding yeah. savant su surprised oh, yeah. a lot of people yeah. in Jackson in yeah, 2021 with his yeah, win there. Yeah, but yeah, Alaska's yeah, not yeah, his <laughs> natural home. But as you said, Mary, he thrives under pressure and you can never write him off. And that's one of the things that really comes into play. The mental game, especially in gnarly terrain like this, is so important. You have to be able to keep your composure because you are riding these things on, on site for the first time. And he is fantastically strategic. You watch him in a slope style contest and he knows exactly how to play the game. And he'll be doing exactly the same thing here. Lovely front side 180, setting up, switch. He's been reading the rule book. Yes. <laughs> and just a quick revert back to his regular stance. It's interesting to see the uh, evolution of the riders kind of learning those ins and outs of what the judges are looking for and how to kind of navigate this terrain within the contest parameters. Well, that's exactly what McMorris has done. He's looked at Dustin Craven's scores from Boldface and gone, he got put through the roof for those switch turns. I'm pulling in there. So I have to feel a little bit like Mark is kind of like familiarizing himself, as you put it so well, range finding the terrain right now. Yeah, he's working this spine. 
Very similar line to Ben Ferguson up here. And he's come onto this really scary nose. You've got to get your speed right off the end of that. A little bit shorter than Ben Ferguson there, but he gets a lovely transfer. Is he setting up? Nice backside 360, just floating into that landing right there. Beautiful butter out of the bottom as well. Clean set of heels on the face. That was very, very tidy. Super tech up top. He managed to get a bit of freestyle in down at the bottom. Feels like he's ticking all boxes. I do feel that he's holding back a little bit, though. I think that, you know, we saw him last year in Alaska really go full send, and Mark has a lot more in the tank. I think that's him getting a run down on his feet, feeling things out, and setting himself up for run number two. Well, we're seeing the competitor in him. He wants to see what those switch turns are worth up top as well. I think there's going to be a bit... I think Whoa. the judges will sense a bit of a layup in there, and they're going to be very careful to measure that score because of that. Kind of got a little bit lost at one point. <laughs> yeah, that is not what you want to have on drone. a face like that. And that's um, such a thing here. Yeah, I know. I kind of, like, I wasn't meant to go off that one cliff, but I'm glad I was going slow. I just barely cleared the rock. And then I was able to hit that hit at the bottom I wanted, but I definitely didn't want to do a back three. Ben Ferguson uh, so had way more confidence off that really steep nose. And it showed, didn't it, Mark? Didn't know exactly yeah, I, where he was, so he really crept off it. And that makes so much sense where to hear his I feedback got, now. It's so cool to be able to hear. All discombobulated. That was so random. That, see, that's the explanation right there, because it did seem a little unlike Mark to be riding conservative in that element. And one of the best snowboarders in the world getting tangled up in there. That's, that gives you an idea of just how complicated spine riding is. Back up at the top now, and it is the turn of our bold face winner. It is Dustin Craven out of Calgary in Canada. Coming into Alaska, the pressure is definitely there. I mean, BC is my type of terrain, and I'm around that all the time up here. There's no trees for one. And then uh, just the ability of people coming up here and having ridden the train before and having a good look and a good eye for how big things actually are. Um, my biggest challenge up here will definitely be like standing at the bottom and not knowing what really works and connects because I'm just not that used to it. But it's also when you're around people that are so superior at it, it's also such just a good learning opportunity. Um, I've been riding for Yes for three seasons now. and. They've been a great partner with me because um, they gave me the opportunity and the support to uh, get out there and help me travel this year. And then also uh, Eagle Pass partnered with uh, Yes, so I was fortunate enough before this trip to go out and get some heli days in. So we did three heli days in Revelstoke and we were riding big lines, so that was kind of helping with building my confidence and stuff. Um, they're just all old snowboarders and snowboarders that everyone looks up to. So it's uh, nice to have a rider-driven brand to be a part of. Dustin, the TAE Natural Selection champion from Baldface, won a ski do while he was there, in, in addition to uh, massive bragging rights. Yeah, and he mentioned there, I mean, if you're on Yes, you're basically getting the OK from Roman DeMarkey, JP Solberg, and DCP, so yeah. And he's on the standard, which is, it's a directional board, but it's not tapered. Love that start with that back three off of that zone that we haven't seen opened up yet. That was very cool. Okay, couple of setup turns on to this big feature. Ooh, that was a sizable launch right there. I mean, that's the thing about Dustin. You can see this calculation, but also, oh, backing that up with a front side 360, but also he's very creative. And we've seen that, I feel like, in his contest runs at Natural Selection and in his video parts. He's gone from being quite a kind of wedge-orientated kicker rider for me into taking on more and more bigger lines through BC and Alaska. Completely. I mean, his trajectory and his style of riding is very, very unique, and it never lets up, regardless of the terrain that he's in, which makes him a very exciting uh, competitor in this competition. Of course, taking this little bit less featured route that we saw Mikkel do on his first run. Oh, but then going, uh, was that a... Front seven. Wow. But it's tomahawked out of it. And there's been a lot of debate. Uh, for yeah. a lot of people, it's one of the areas where I think there's some confusion. You can get away with some falls, even deck tearing, obviously hand drags, bum drags, not an issue. But if you're 
If you're tomahawking like that, then it is going to hit your score. Yes. Martin McMorris gets a little bit lost on this run by his own admission, but there's still some gems to pull out of this. He was riding very well. It just was for him, you know, not fully on the throttle because of that. So I think it's going to be looking toward that next run to really see what he can do on this because still solid. Yeah, back three down at the bottom here. And we heard him talking. He wanted more than that. The backside 360, the ultimate safety or setup trick. Got a nice little butter in there as well. And of course, Dustin had a really strong start to his run. I believe it was technical, it was unique. Right there with that backside 360 off of that rock face right there. You get that lovely. Again, we've, there's been a lot of talk about this. We're moving away from those Jackson Hole really big, wide takeoffs that you have. When you start seeing really nice angled takeoffs where riders have got to measure exactly where they're taking off, how far they're going, and what angle it's going to put them into the landing. And he's getting that around, but just getting caught up on that landing right there. On the head went down. The body language said it all there, didn't it? Good, nice work. So two very, this is yeah. the this is the judging conundrum. You really are apples and oranges here. You've got one very steady run where Mark got a bit lost, and then you've got one slightly stronger run, but with some technical instabilities. So 80 points for McMorris, 60 points for Dustin Craven. Craven under the pump for the second run. And now we have heat for Torstein Horgmo, Sage Katzenberg, two riders that have followed fairly similar paths, bringing the slopestyle ethos into the backcountry. Yeah, and Torstein, the only three. rider who's Fair out here on a true twin. Be interesting to see how he gets on. It's tough to put into words, but I feel like I've already, as cheesy as it sounds, but like just being here in the first place is a huge win for all of us. And and just being able to be here, having the opportunity to be here and be able to ride these mountains and, and this, this terrain in itself, to me is fantasy boarding and as something you dream about. Yeah, for me as a, a rider, having worked with these endemic brands and companies for, for so long, like Oakley, Capita, Union, Nerona, and uh, GoPro as well, they, uh, They've been supporters of me and, and my journey for so long. And it's really cool to see them also partner up with NST and and help fuel this this vision of of, of Rice and, and company and to, to make sure this thing keeps going because it's it's so dear to all of us and it's such a positive thing in snowboarding. It's a collective and it it really brings us all together um, as an industry as well, as as just uh, the riders on tour. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Now, I don't want to oversimplify anything, but I guess what is so interesting about this matchup between these two is that both of these riders have come from such intense competitive backgrounds and are both very, very mentally strong. Torstein has ridden basically everything before. And he spent a bit of time in Alaska as well. It may not be his, his natural habitat, but he's definitely got Alaska smarts and he proves it straight off the bat with a big spread eagle method. Torstein also has the mental game just so unlocked. You can see him, he's riding very confidently through this spine. Yeah, really, really attacking that, bouncing either side of it, killing his speed, but using it with turns. Like there's no side slipping here. Dropping that band and heading into this rider's left side section. It's the same transition we saw Travis make. Like cutting across the that big guts of the chute and getting himself back up onto the top of this spine. Little front one. And going cab one into the gut right there as he approaches this next spine. There's it's a sizable as well. Yes. Now he's got his eye on something, hasn't he? Backside 360, finding the landing perfectly and heading right into this next, oh, front side air off of that hit. 
It was proper. That was Arthur Longo, wasn't it? It was like an Alaskan side hit. Yeah, that was beautiful. He's so calculated, but yet so fluid. I mean, Torstein really is just a force. You've hit the nail on the head perfectly there. That was a very, very clever run from Torstein. I wasn't sure in Jackson whether he'd be up for getting back into a competition format, but he is so clever when he pulls on a bib. And I think that that's never left him. He's brought that same mentality to filming over the years. And so seeing him in this element, he has slid right back in very simply. But of course, the same can be said in a lot of ways in his own life for Sage Kotzenberg, who really turns it on. We saw it in Jackson. Under pressure, he excels. Yeah, I mean, winning in Alaska would be crazy. It's the last stop of the tour. It's kind of, you know, the holy grail of snowboarding up here. It's where everyone looks at someone, you know, their line riding capability, I think, is really heralded in snowboarding. So taking a win up here would be unreal, especially against, I mean, the crew up here is pretty next nice level. A lot of a lot of guys and, and ladies that have spent some serious time up here. So it'd mean a lot. Yeah, so this is my third time to Alaska. I've been two times before always with a crew that hasn't been here that much, so not much experience. I'm lo I'm really looking forward to spending time with Trav, Torstein, Mickle, for, you know, people have spent in some serious time up here and just picking their brains and sitting back and listening and just taking it all in. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here without my sponsors and this tour wouldn't be here without sponsors, especially ones that have been in snowboarding so long. Oakley, K2, GoPro, BOA, they back me so hard and I got big love for them. They let me do what I love, and it's been my dream as a kid to be here and standing in front of this camera talking about, you know, Alaska and at the last stop. Competing with Travis Rice is just something I would have just dreamed about when I was 14, so very hyped. Sage Kotzenberg enrolled in the University of Alaska. His tutor today is Travis Rice at the moment, highest score on the board so far, but Sage dropping in, one of the hardest working men in snowboarding who makes it look effortless. Strong start on the top of that spine too, dropping in very much with authority from Sage. He's really hacking into that, isn't he? You can see when there's an urgency and a real energy to the riders, when they want to get their teeth stuck into this terrain. And they know that the snow is so perfect right now, that great combination of uh, smooth, but yet with enough density to provide them with some pop. Okay, working out. Same zone that we saw Ben Ferguson rip through. Coming down onto spine number two. Great snow. Really deep through here. Okay, really working out this triple section. Oh, opening up something new with the front three, landing a little bit on the tail right there. He managed to hold on to it, didn't he? So front three, back three combo through that critical section. And then out onto the apron at the bottom here. And the big hits have gone, so... He got a bit of meat in the middle of the run there, but felt like he burned quite a bit up top. Yeah, I'm interested to see what the judge's reaction to this is going to be. Again, I think Torstein started off with that beautiful kicked out method right at top and really was uh, navigating this with a lot of strength from the very beginning. Well, interestingly, for two of the guys who are on like twin tip boards, Sage has got slightly, I think he's got a bit more volume in the nose than tail, but there's only that's the only switch riding we saw. We saw that little link. And I do think if we're working on the same messages we saw from judges in Baldface, I think that switch combination there between the front one and the cab one is going to work really, really hard for Torstein. I agree. That's part of what the Alaskan train also naturally kind of contributes to is the judges want to see the you know, hit to hit riding. And this is a natural kind of uh, incarnation of that aesthetic. Yeah, there's that front three from Sage. And it was in a critical part of the face and he linked it quickly into this back three. So you have got a good combo there. But I feel like the top of the run was just a little bit light. But let's see what the judges make of it. So sick. It's almost, unreal. I almost pulled my airbag halfway down without no. an avalanche. <laughs> Too much. 
Too much. Can't take it. Oh, respect the half the half cab. Thank you. Yeah, that was How's this stuff down here? Extremely blind. Snow pretty good. So the snow is so, so stable. Yeah. The volume of snow we've had in the last couple of days, 60 centimetres, almost two feet. And there are only a couple of areas of instability on the sunnier aspects. So Torstein Horgmo, 85 over Sage Kotzenberg, 63. Confirmation of what we're seeing from the judges there in terms of that switch repertoire and trick linking. Let me see. Hit the lander. Yup. Dude, how a Trav's gap, huh? <laughs> that is the talking Jeez. point of the day so far. Travis Rice's gap. So an amazing men's first run of quarterfinals. Second run's coming up very shortly. And now we move to the women's semis. And first up, a hammer of a heat between Hannah Beeman and Zoe sadowski Sinnott. Look at those two profile pictures. It tells you everything you need to know about the way these two are going to approach this. First in, though, it is Hannah Beeman, the uh, veteran, one of the most experienced women in the backcountry. It feels awesome to be back in Alaska. I feel like last year I kind of wasn't expecting to get to go to Alaska, so it was a last minute kind of like, oh, gosh, get up here. And this year I'm a little more prepared, so it's nice to come into it feeling a little more confident that I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Uh, I think a win here for me would just be a little bit of redemption for last year. Um, I didn't don't feel like I rode to my ability last year. I feel like I was a little too laid back and wasn't in the competitive mindset. I think just kind of showing what I can do in Alaska, I feel like I fell short of that last year. So a little bit of redemption this year would be nice. Just having Vans and Ride a part of this is awesome because you know they've supported me for so long and for me being able to be on this kind of a stage and kind of give them some love back and get them some visibility so they can continue to help support me and make awesome product is is great it's interesting to hear hannah say that she felt she felt that she fell short a bit in 2021 because her run was really gnarly, very, very technical, but just lacked some of those freestyle touches, perhaps. Yeah, she worked that spine. It was super exposed, like a really, like one of the gnarliest runs we've seen in women's free riding. But yeah, the judges are really specific. They want to see backcountry freestyle. This isn't a big mountain contest. So Hannah knows that now. She's got that in her strategy box and she can say, okay, Right, I can I can add in the freestyle, I just need to keep that exposure there. She's got those skills. And I think that's part of what makes her such a threat in snowboarding and on this tour, because she is very much always pushing herself to the next level. I mean, she has been a legend, a leader in the backcountry for quite some time with no sign of letting up. And we see this confident navigation of her first run right now as she kind of gets her way down this to this lower section. Yeah, you can see it big, clean, confident turns on the top of the ridge there, and she's working onto the nose of this spine. Little bit hesitant there, but sends it straight down into the gut, trying to stay on the toes there, bouncing around a little bit to make it back onto this side. And that's where her experience comes through as well, really knowing exactly where she was going to that second feature. Oh, goodness. There it was, and we go. talked about that a couple of minutes ago. That instability on the sunny side of the face. The way I wanted to. Bit of slough coming down there, so it's broken off on that warmer side. Oh, beautiful backside 360 to cap things off on her run. So Hannah Beeman didn't go exactly where she wanted to. You could tell she kind of got caught on the wrong side of that spine at one stage. And found herself cutting back, but I think she's made a really, really, if that wasn't what she wanted, she's still put a really solid run down. Yeah, I think that is a great foundation heading into her second run. And if you take a look on Hannah's left shoulder here, you can see that orange handle, that is a Decline airbag. So if she had got snagged by that slab that broke off, she would have had an airbag. A very, very useful piece of kit up here in Alaska. And now we head back up to the top that a rider that doesn't have as much of the experience, but she is an incredibly yeah. quick learner as we have seen on the tour last year to this year. Zoe Sadowski, Senate. Last year, my first time in Alaska was an insane experience. And I feel like 
um, I learnt so much from it and got to go to Haynes and film uh, in the mountains there as well. And I feel like I learnt a lot from uh, those two trips. So going to bring that into this year. It would be super sick to win the Alaska stuff. It's the, I think it's like the the boss battle kind of. It's the um, the biggest one in the gnarliest terrain. So it would be awesome. Yeah, Burden um, is one of my main sponsors and I'm super lucky to have them behind me. They help me with a lot of things and making sure that I'm staying warm out on the glacier and uh, getting all the right equipment and um, yeah I love their snowboards so it's awesome to have them uh, a part of uh, who I am as a snowboarder. Classic Kiwi, she's so modest but I guarantee you she's got a heart the size of Oklahoma. She is a wonderful human being and she is quite frankly a breathtaking snowboarder as well. We saw a stomp, a double cork 1080 at the Olympics a couple of months ago that reverberated around the world. What can she do here in Alaska? I mean, last year she came out of the gate with such explosive riding. I think we've all been waiting to see what she can do now. Look at that, just a massive gap to start things off. And beautifully, like she measured that to the landing perfectly. You know, for someone that's only her second season riding in Alaska, she has this innate way of reading the terrain. It's really quite incredible to watch. Right, steepest section of the face there, just making her way down that spine, then across this nose. Picking her way through a little bit tentative, exploring the terrain. Breaking fresh trail here. Is she going to stay up on this nose? What she found? Oh my goodness! <laughs> Cracks the seal on a whopper right in the middle of that face. That was beautiful. Arches out a toe edge turn as well. Very, very strong statement from Zoe sadowski sinop And that's what's so interesting here. You know, we're watching, being like, okay, she's picking her way down, she's moving a little slow, and then she does that. It's phenomenal how quickly she's acclimatized to Alaskan terrain. She is such a strong snowboarder across the board. She grew up at Snow Park, <laughs> so she saw the likes of yeah. Seb Toots, Mark McMorris, Spencer <laughs> O'Brien every Southern, he oh, Southern no. Hemisphere winter riding in front of her. And she had her 10,000 hours by the that age of 12 or 13. Sweet. So Thanks. you can see know. that in her riding. Yeah. But reading terrain like that Woo. and applying it in a contest format, I that is mind-blowing. I wasn't able to get on the last feature I wanted to get onto. Yeah. So hopefully next round I can get on top of that. Yeah. But it went, it went. It that is like going to be a big, big yeah. scalp. Yeah. If she can take out Hannah Beeman first <laughs> round, <laughs> Yeah, hearts are thumping, the adrenaline is pumping. Two very different approaches to these runs. Hannah Beeman, very, very solid up top. She got into some serious exposure, but was maybe lacking those freestyle elements. Yeah, her riding, her navigation was very, very strong. You can see there that, that slide that set off a bit, but not phasing her. And I think that the lower part of her run was actually my favorite. Yeah, she got that really well-measured backside 360 off the bottom there. But Zoe, she opened, she started the way she finished really, really strong. Little shifty into that transition. I feel like watching her ride, you could see the gears turning. As we were following her downhill with that drone angle, it was just, you know, she was picking apart the train, figuring things out, and then she just came down here and unleashed. And what's lovely, when you see it like this, she is so sure-footed. And she didn't come off the size of that side of that. That was right off the nose. Yeah, she really has so much courage, but yet so much calmness. It's very wild. Well, that hit as well. She's bouncing through there on her heel edge. Right? And it doesn't look like it's really, really bottomless there. It's throwing you around. But Zoe just, she's, she's able to sit on that heel edge using the, exactly the same board, interestingly, as both Mark McMorris and Ben Ferguson, the hometown hero, but in a 152. So there's quite a lot of taper on that board. It's got 10 mil of taper. So the nose is wider than the tail and the board naturally floats. Wow, very close there. So 76 for Hannah, that 
The, I think the middle section of Zoe's may be a little bit light. Yes, and I think that the top section for Hana was very technical and very confident, and then she had that backside 360 down lower, which helped her. Yeah, 100%. It's that freestyle element. You've got to have it in there. Plenty for both Zoe and Hannah to think about. Now, it's semi-final number two, Marianne Hayati versus Elena Height. And for me, Elena Height, one of the most improved riders through men's and women's between 2021 and 2022. She looked to me like a different rider, but we're gonna kick off with the French woman out of Chamrous in Southern France. It's Marion Hayati, four-time Freeride World Tour champion, back in Alaska for natural selection. Natural selection event in Alaska is the pinnacle, I think. This is the top about what is backcountry for snowboarding. I think maybe Alaska is more a Chamonix style, uh, steep, uh, natural structures, I mean, natural features. Um, maybe I can reach differently this stage, uh, maybe with less freestyle in my mind, but maybe more like jumping big cliff and going really straight with a fast uh, style. Um, yeah, um, I'm really excited about this stage because I think I can express my kind of snowball on this one. Just I would like to say thanks to the North Face, Rossignol, Vance and Pock. We are the chance to express, express our creativity and project thanks to this kind of brand. And I feel really lucky right now uh, because I can make what I want for snowboarding, I can reach my goals, I can reach my dreams, and yeah, I'm really thankful. So last year, Marion had punched her ticket to AK, but because of travel restrictions, was not able to make it into the last event. So this is a huge like opportunity for her, and really this is her wheelhouse. She is so incredible at reading terrain and navigating technical steeps. We saw it in Jackson and Baldface. She goes mock down gnarly, gnarly steeps, so. But she has been introducing the freestyle element. She got that backflip and the 360 in there, and she got a background. She was riding slope style for quite a while before she got into border cross and then big mountain riding, and breaking fresh ground out here now to the rider's right-hand side down spine number five. She has so much confidence in her riding. I mean, I've been looking forward to watching her ride in AK since last year for sure. And look at that very, very nice drop. Okay, she's got to work this speed out. Like She's killed it nicely, but if she wants to pull some of these features in and not just stay in the guts of this shoot. Front side air tap right there. She's got loads to work with here. It's just making sure she can find it. So this is where the route finding comes in because she's blind to this spine now. The drone gives us a little more perspective. She's found a window in here. And this is that sunny aspect and there's a crust in there, isn't there? You could hear it. Big lump, this. Okay, does a bit of a double hit, taking it a little bit conservatively off of that, but still, you know. Yeah, I'm gonna go in hard. She could have attacked that more and I think she'd say the same thing. There was, there was some lovely exposure in there. Big clap of the hands. And the drop to start it off was really yes. strong. But I do, I do feel like if you get sucked down, we saw the same with Zoe's on the end and with Dustin Craven. If you get sucked into the guts of these shoots, you start to lose options. You want to be up on top of those spines. We could hear that as well, couldn't we? Those, I think they're west, south, west, even southwest facing sunny sides of the spines are getting a bit crusty. And we saw the instability in Hannah's run as well. Uh, back up to the top now, and it is the turn of Elena Height. I think in general, Alaska is the ultimate proving ground for snowboarding. Uh, you know, there's no place in the world like it. And I grew up watching video parts from Alaska. I think everyone, you know, really looks to Alaska as like the pinnacle. And so I think it's really important that natural selection has a stop here. It really like has all of the elements of snowboarding brought to this like really pinnacle part of snowboarding and in, in a special place. Um, and to be a part of, you know, the only the second year that, that natural selection is, is gonna be in Alaska is really exciting. 
Yeah, I mean, I feel really lucky personally to be supported by um, a number of endemic brands that have had my back really for a long time in my career. Um, GoPro, Jones, and my newest sponsor, Arcteryx, um, have really supported kind of my transition into the backcountry. And so it's really great to see them on the Natural Selection Alliance and supporting me as an athlete, but also snowboarding culture as a whole. You know, Elena's legacy as a half pipe competitor is so grand, it's so strong, but in the past few seasons, I think that she's really found her home in the backcountry. We saw the beginning of her experience in Alaska in Unconditional with Jamie Anderson, and she had such incredible riding in that, and that was when she was nascent in this terrain, and right now, she has so much momentum. But we, we always see it, don't we? Ben Ferguson, Dustin Craven, Elena Height, pipe riders edge control transferring effortlessly to backcountry terrain. When you've got board control like this, you can do what you want to a degree. Yes, and just the start of her run, very, very smooth, very, very in control. And she has an inherent confidence in her line navigation that you can see very clearly. And I, that's what I saw in Jackson was this really, really strong confidence, like so settled on her board. And look at her, there's purpose. Like, it's almost like she's riding chin first, attacking the face. Yes, totally. Oh, beautiful oh. hack right there. So getting high up onto this spine. Okay. Giving herself a pep talk <laughs> as she drops down across. That's a lovely angle. Oh, a bit of a hesitation there. And this is literally, if you're a bank robber, you're burning time in the vault right now. Standing up there, you're signposting to the judges that you're not exactly sure where you are. So coming a bit further around this nose. Finding her line again right now. Ooh, that is very gnarly. Oh, and this is, it's so hard as a rider because you want to commit, you want to go because Right now, hesitation is telling the judges everything. Controlled that really Ooh. well. Oh my gosh, my heart was beating in my chest on that one. That exposure was, uh, that's an intense thing to come up on. Yeah, she. it was a drop that she obviously hadn't scoped, so she had to commit to it. She controlled the landing really well and then skewed herself over the bars a little bit. Coming now, same hit that we saw Zoe take on. Going backside 360 and getting it around. Yeah, I think she's get, she's made the judges' job easy there, is what you say about that. Those those two big hesitations in the middle of the face. Judges are going to pounce on that. We know how hard their job is, and the moment you give them an excuse, they're going to grab that with both hands. Completely. Perfect. Oh, I just go. Perfect. Yes, I'm happy. Sick. Yeah. To open the cliff uh, at the top. We talked about how confident Marion was on that run, and, and you, that you was a complete so contrast in terms of Elena there. It? Yeah, it didn't feel very... No, no, it was, uh, <laughs> it was nice. Okay, let's take a look at a recap. First up, it's Marion. This is a very interesting matchup, of course, because both these riders are so strong, and they both went after very different routes. I love that little needle thread up at the top there. Same thing that we saw Dustin Craven backside three through. And then over this roll, that's that bowling ball effect that we talked about. Like, turns in there. She could have side-slipped easily off the nose of that, but she had the confidence. That angle really shows more of its size, too. That was very, a very sizable drop. Getting that grab in right there, very key when it comes to what the judges are looking for. And I feel like this last drop, it'd be good to see this from a different angle, just in case the drone flattened it, but I would have liked to have seen her attack it maybe a little bit more. And speaking of attacking, those beautiful turns from Elena right at the top. And this is crunch time for Elena right now. Like, she needs to make it through these semis if she wants to entertain the idea of taking that natural selection overall title. That was almost a butter back three. Yeah. So still very, very close. We'll get a great indication of how much the risk category and criteria play into the judges' hands here. Because Elena's slowing down. That, like, once you start slowing down, you're reducing the risk. So the judges are get, that's what we were talking about, the judges jumping on. Seven, four, 
74 for Marion, 65 for Elena Height. Elena Height on the lowest score so far because we had 76 for Hannah Beeman, 78 for Zoe sadowski sinot So right now, after the first runs of the women's semis, Elena Height is in fourth place. But you know that she's not going to feel okay being in that position. Obviously, she's the gears are turning already for Elena. 100%, but she's got her work cut out. We've seen some fantastic riding, and we'll be back with the second runs, the men's quarters, and the women's semis very shortly. Before we do, though, we're going to get stuck into some mountain safety, courtesy of our retail partners, Backcountry. Riding in Alaska, there's glaciers, avalanches, many, many hazards. It's the most dangerous, funnest, longest runs that you'll ever ride. Alaska is really the final frontier. And Magnitude is unbelievable. Many times you're completely remote with zero resources um, other than some sort of aircraft, which may not even get to you if the weather's bad. Weather forecast is, it's, um, you can't really trust it always out here. <laughs> Yeah, weather in Alaska is notorious for just switching in minutes. One second it's sunny and all is well, and then the next you're standing on a ridge and it's white out and you don't even know where you're going anymore. Working deep in the mountains like this, it moves fast, it changes fast, and you don't exactly know what you're gonna get all the time. Make sure when the helicopter comes in, you're buttoned tight, you know, gloves on, goggles on. These athletes are highly skilled and experienced in the mountains, but what we do for them is run safety and we're there in case something did go wrong. The guide brings in just a lot more knowledge on this area than we have. They're in the mountains all year. In any mountainous environment, especially a glaciated environment, there are quite a few hazards. Rock falls, ice falls, or Syrac falls. There's cliffs, there's crevasses, and then obviously yeah, avalanches. You know, there's been a number of experiences I've had in Alaska that, you know, I've learned from. Cornices failing, instabilities, avalanches. Uh, you know, I've got caught in a couple. Without the gates, we can't ride this kind of mountains for sure. Some of the tools we bring to help mitigate risk, a beacon, shovel, probe, airbag, we require everyone to have that in the mountains. And in Alaska, a glaciated environment, we require everyone to have a harness as well. You gotta be up to speed on what to do if things go wrong and practice the things you need to know, like how to use your backcountry equipment and how to have the proper harness and have it set up right and know how to trigger your airbag and you need to be dialed in on up here. You plan for the worst and hope for the best. Having top-notch guiding team working with us, whether we're just free riding or whether we're trying to pull off an event like this, it's just the responsible thing to do. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain speaking. Zoe's sitting pretty. I mean, she's, I think she's gonna try to improve upon, you know, what she's done. She's taken the same line as before and Oh my God. Stomps. What? Just the upstart <laughs> from, uh, from Down Under. I don't, can Down Under apply to New Zealand? <laughs> and coming into that backside three on the toes. Yes. Wow. And I love the mics. You know, you could hear her psyching herself up front. I mean, this is crazy watching her ride. Like, this is her first time here. I know I keep saying that, but I, we cannot dismiss the fact with how kind of uh, much she's charging, despite the fact that this is not terrain that she's familiar with at all. Yeah, I mean, she's she's New Zealander, so you know there is some incredible terrain uh, in New Zealand. There's a lot of incredible backcountry, and in New Zealand being a small island and so coastal, um, you know, we sometimes refer to it when it does have good conditions as Little Alaska. That explains things a little bit then. <laughs> yeah, it still, it still doesn't fully prepare you for just the grandioseness of the scale up here. Everything is bigger than it is. Wow. 
<laughs> I mean, this kid is just not afraid. Look at her landings from that three, just there, that cliff drop, and then she has no problem landing in this deeper snow. And that is a skill all in itself. I mean, she's coming from, like you said, Slemma, the world champs on a slope style where you're landing groomed runs, and it's a totally different thing to be landing in powder like this. Welcome back to the Yeti Natural Selection in Alaska. So a great piece on mountain safety just before the break there. And we've got 36 crew up on the glacier here in the Alaska backcountry. And all of the Natural Selection crew, 20 people, are all wearing backcountry apparel. So well looked after in freezing temperatures. Time to get the men's quarterfinals second runs underway. And we start with that repeat of last year's final, Mikel Bang up against Ben Ferguson. Mikel dropping in first, and he's got some work to do here, Mary. Yes, Mikkel, of course, opened up the competition today, but I think the one point that you brought up, Ed, that's so important is that he really builds upon whatever he is doing as opposed to reacting to other riders when he's competing. Yeah, he, d he knows where he wants to go, and it's almost like that first run's given him the speed, the angles that he needs to attack in the terrain. And I, I want to see some big, I expect to see some big, big tricks from Mikel here. Like, that was very nice, uh, front one. Switchback five! Oh, he's gone down a little, but he's up. I think that's going to be an incidental uh, crash there. Yes, I agree Little smear, I don't think they're going to kill him on that, especially because he linked the front one into that, like, couple of switch turns. Difficult takeoff. Beautiful front side air right there. I'm fascinated by this run because I feel like this this guts of the shoot kills the momentum of the run at the end, but Mikhail, he's committed to it. Clean frontside 360 right there. Got that no classic Euro tweaking style as well. You can almost hear his bindings creaking. He's got so much leverage with those long legs. Very, very strong run for Mikhail Bang. And we, we talked about it. We knew we were going to see something big, but switch back five in the middle of an yeah. Alaskan face. I mean, that's, that's money right there. That's so gnarly, so technical. And he really does make it look like it's almost an afterthought, just very casual, just kind of does it off the cuff. Well, everyone always talks about it. Like, big guys, they can make snowboarding look hard, but it's always effortless with Mikel. Okay, back up to the top. 2018, he was fourth place in Pyeongchang with a devastatingly creative pipe run. But since then, he's transferred all of that edge control, all of that beautiful creativity effortlessly into the backcountry. And I, I feel like at the moment, this quarterfinal is, is the pendulum swinging in Ben's favor. Yes, I agree. He came in very, very strong. I mean, that energy, that explosiveness, that explosiveness, excuse me, that he entered into his run with, I expect we're going to see that and then some for this one. Okay, same again, heading out to the left-hand side here. And he's, look at the speed he's carrying already. Like, there's no brakes at all through this first section. Yeah, he is just motoring method off of that first drop. But you keep in the back of your mind that the, all of these riders now know, since Baldface, that switch riding, any combos of tricks that link 180s, 540s are going to score really highly. And I'd love to see Ben starting to sniff around some of those combos. And we know he's capable of it, like his switch McTwist in his pipe run was a thing of beauty. It was the sort of crowning figurehead at the end of that run. Okay, here he comes into that drop section. I mean, that's a massive drop right there. Oh, and he's carrying speed through there. Oh. Stalled a tiny bit, but new nose, opening up some fresh terrain. Oh! Wow! And that was a little, the landing was a little bit too flat for the ambition of the jump. Huge oh, back three. Massive three. Wow, getting that around, that was enormous. So a huge run, a little bit loose. 
but very, very impressive nonetheless. Opening up fresh terrain as well. We know that that starts to max out the creativity bar from the judges. Completely. They really want to see that. I mean, there's also that risk challenge of that because no one has written that. You don't have a good sense of exactly, you know, what the landings are like, what you're going to be dropping into in that situation. Okay, so at the moment, Ben Ferguson sat on a 78, Mikel Bang on a 70. Mikel stepped it up, but he did it in a line that he'd already tasted. It was, it was, it was fresh fruit for Ben Ferguson out to the left-hand side. But that switch backside spin, I mean, I think that that is going to skyrocket his score for and the And it judges. was linked. Look at that. He got the grab, the composure on the front one yeah. there. That's really difficult to land on that toe edge switch and set up. I mean, I think that is going to be real jet fuel for his score. A hundred percent, yeah, you've called it there. That was Just glorious so as well, wasn't it? smooth. I mean, this was and this was very strong. Everyone struggled on their heels up that takeoff. It's a natural takeoff. It's bobbling. You're on your heels. And Mikhail's popped like it was a big, wide takeoff. And Ben had authority in his run. He was really riding very smoothly, but he just didn't have that same element of, of tricks that, that Mikkel brought. I mean, that was, gosh, that was just enormous. Though. I'm wondering, looking at it from that drone angle, it almost looks like he's gone either a tiny bit too far or a tiny bit too short. Yeah. He landed in the bottom of that transition and it just, the impact was too much to take. Two meters shorter, two meters longer, he might have made that. Okay, school's coming in. 77 for Mikel. It's one point shy of Ben Ferguson. So the result is reversed from the finals last year. Ben Ferguson will advance to the semi finals. Wow, that was uh, a kind of the definition of a nail biter right there. Oh my goodness. I got to figure out what I'm going to do. That is what we're here for. That is what all of us have come to watch the highest level of snowboarding and it coming down to the wire. Now, the Alaskan rookie, just 23 years old, he's so light-footed, so spry in his riding. He's bringing a real energy that's waking up some of the older heads in this field. Jared Elston, a little bit pedestrian, we called it, or conservative in his first run. Is he gonna light things up for number two? I think that's one thing that we've seen from Jared's riding in the past two stops, is that he can really open it up and just goes for it, and he does so with control and just being able to watch him hopefully bring that to this terrain. That's what you want, isn't it? That primal scream yes. that we saw in the Temple of Stoke back in Jackson <laughs> in the finals going up against Sage. And at the moment, there's trepidation here. And that's going to open the door for Travis because he doesn't, he's so authoritative when he goes down these spines. Oh, and it's the scale, isn't it? That's what Jared's getting used to here. This, you can pick up speed so quickly and the features are all so much bigger than you think they are. So you suddenly, you could hear the shock in his voice. Oh my <laughs> God. You're thinking, oh, I've overcooked this. But he's got into that lovely north facing side of the spine. Snow quality is primo oh, in there. It's absolutely perfect. Silent as well. Oh God. You can hear it right there. I think this, this honestly though is this is just foreshadowing oh look at that back oh, three beautiful. that was amazing that's what i i mean when you say that jared just he will go for it yes. Whoa, yes. beautiful backside on, 720. that was gorgeous oh, he has got hung up in exactly the same spot who did we see pop out there it's a really, I think it was Travis, after that little yes. step down that he had, he popped off those same little rollers, bit deceptive there. But how has the backside three into that pocket then set himself straight into the seven? We're looking at those, the creativity and the face reading of natural terrain there. He linked those together so quickly. Yes, that was so rad. And again, that's what I mean is like, we're seeing Jared's really, his first foray right. into this, this kind of terrain, but it, it bodes very well that he is already doing this. I mean. Well, Travis has backed him into a corner. Yes. And, and we've already seen Jared's got a little bit of the wild dog in him. And Travis, with that huge first run, has backed him into the corner, a little bit soft on the top, and then he just opens up the second half of that run. And no doubt, he's put some pressure on Travis. Oh, completely. I mean, a, a backside 720 at the bottom. Travis is up there being like, okay, what do I need to do to ratchet up my line right now? All right, boys, see the bottom. 
So Travis Rice dropping in for his second and final run in the quarterfinals. Huge wow. first turn. Beautiful hack right there from the man from Jackson. Detonating a couple of turns up top, crossing that spine. Winding his way up onto the front of this nose. And he's carrying speed, isn't he? Little drop. Oh! oh! The back five and reverts out of it. He had to switch that round pretty quickly. But that will be clean. The, he may take, the judges may take a little off in that combination, linking sense. But the trick itself was immaculate. And hitting cross court to the second spine and backside 360 into the spine just to the left of that. And you saw on the landing there how much composure Travis has got. He wasn't even thinking about the landing. He was already looking at the next feature. Exactly, and that's so important when, as you said before, you have, you lose so much vertical so quickly that really maximizing every place that you are in is so important. Oh, Cap seven! Oh what wow. is he, what was he thinking? So he'd linked it. We'd seen that beautiful front one again. Effortless switch turns to a cab seven. Wow, I mean, that was him ratcheting things up. Oh my goodness, a glimpse of what Travis Rice's ambitions for natural selection are. It's gonna be interesting. I, so we've got a 90 point score from Travis on run one. I don't think, I mean, the backside five, with the front one and the cab, this run is huge. If he can, I, oh, I want to see how much he gets taken off for bombing that cab seven, but. And I think what we're looking at is, if he advances into the semifinals, that's a terrifying direction that he's taking. And massive gap from Jared Elston right there. A little bit wobbly in the air, of course, and but he's really following, sending it. That's where Travis went with the back three first go. So we kind of know like the 90 point score is beyond Jared at this point. I think we can assume that Travis is gonna go through, but still, look at that. And I think what's so important to note is that regardless of what the outcome is, is we are seeing a glimpse of what is possible from Jared Elston. This is just him really kind of, you know, dipping his toes into Alaska right now. So there's more to come from him. And he's adapted to the natural selection format so quickly. The next three or four years are gonna be fascinating for him, but right now, if you're going up against Travis Rice in the Jeez. semifinals, be really, really scared. Like, he has got the bit between his teeth today. That backside 540 up at the top. Then the back three to get into this little line here. And look at the speed he's carrying. He's just floating through here. And look at the exposure off to his left-hand side. And he looks so calm and collected. I mean, it's, it's semi-superhuman. That was... And most of us couldn't do that no. forwards. And he's just come in <laughs> switch. And then this is absolutely enormous. Cam, he is so close to putting this down as well. He, look at the way he puts, he dips his nose in. So nearly got that. And finding that landing right there, just that perfect transition. I mean, like you said, go, the opportunity to go against him in semifinals is terrifying right now. <laughs> he wants this so badly. Okay, no so Travis. Lose to than Travis Rice, I'll say that. <laughs> well, you're almost certainly going to do that today, Jared right, Elston, I'm that afraid. Side. You don't think that'll put you through? I don't think to the 90. Okay, like relay for you. okay, so Travis Rice sat on that 90 from the first run. I think Jared was on a 65, so it's going to be. Like, Jared, I think, could push into the mid 70s, not, maybe late if 70s. Not trying hard enough, so. Wise words from Travis. Yeah, and I tell you what, Tomahawking at 39 is a really different prospect to Tomahawking at 23. So Jared Elston knocks his score up to 73, but he is a full 17 point shy of Travis Rice's first run score of 90. Travis Rice advances to the semifinals, and there he will meet Ben Ferguson. And Honestly, very honorable performance from Jared Elston for his first season on the tour. He can be immensely proud of that. Now we come back to the all Canadian matchup. One of competitive snowboarding's most, if not the most successful yeah, rider of all time, Mark McMorris, going up against the TAE bald face natural selection winner, Dustin Craven. McMorris dropping in first though. And he had quite a clinical first run, I feel, and he's, he's definitely in the driving seat here. 
Oh, beautiful front side 360 to start things off, looking very smooth at the top. It's got that classic. Oh, the front one. So okay. he's, again, we're seeing that big switch riding, drawing out those turns, riding as fast switch as you'll see a lot of people ride normal. That half cab round again. So he's not, arguably, he's, he's doing that as lip service for the judges rather than a really, really technical moment where he's linking it into a big switch takeoff. Exposure with the transfer. Finding a new line there. I mean, Mark looks very, very collected in this run. He looks really, really comfortable in this terrain as well. If you cast your mind back to 2012 at Supernatural, Travis's first iteration of this comp, and he looked, he was so far out of his depth, and now he's one of the, 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 the big players, essentially, the heavyweights of this field. Navigating a backflip off of that second drop yes. right there. I mean, when you see Mark picking his way down, after having done this once already, you know he's, some, he's got something in his pocket. Back three here last time, and he wanted to improve. Oh, Big back my seven. Goodness. That was huge. He almost ran out of landing there, didn't he? Wow. Okay, so that's putting the pressure on Craven for sure. Okay, it'd be good to take a closer look in the recaps at the landing on that seven to see whether the how hard the judges are going to hammer him for that. I agree. Okay. Kind of pending really what happened that landing. I mean, that was a very solid run. But he's pushed a lot harder than his first run. It was an 80 point, I think. Yes. Too much and then, gas. Oh yeah, definitely too much gas up there, Sparky. You could see he opened up on that seven, only to find that he was still. 15, 20 feet off that the ground. so there and I just gassed it way too much. Oh, it's so frustrating for someone as talented as Mark McMorris to know how close that seven was. Back up at the top, fellow countryman Dustin Craven ready to drop in. Yeah. And he's got, he's got some work to do here, Mary. Dustin, I think, has a strategic mind for yeah, boys. what he run. needs to do to perform in this situation. I'm interested to see what he's going to put out there right now. So he strung that little line, same as Marion Hayat. He was looking at the backside 360 through this little hole. OK. Oh, and it, it almost looked like he hadn't made up his mind whether it was back one or back three. It was sort of alley-ooping into that transition, wasn't it? Yeah, it just did not look as authoritative as his first run, for sure. But he's got plenty of exposure to work with here. That was a nice, uh, nice... Step down transfer. Oh, and he's Ooh, got huge! so big! Beautiful. Same as Jared Elston, same as Travis, into that really nice pocket. And it's, you get it from that angle, you could see how far they're stepping out. Big front side 360 right there, very, very clean. He's definitely had some redemption on the bottom side of this face now. That huge transfer and the three. What's he got left? This is the hip that we saw Mikel really boosting off in his second run. Okay, front side one. Oh, no. Using some uh, choice descriptions oh. of that performance. Oh, and getting taken down right there. And again, with Dustin, the body language is so visible. The head dropped straight away. He's not happy with that run at all. You know, I think you said it well during his run. Mark Mark just built on what he had laid out, which is, a, you know, his strategy in general as a competitor. He he gets out there, he susses it out, backflips right there, and uh, puts down a stronger run. And that's the thing. He's still, I feel it with Mark. Like, OK, let's take a look at this landing. Oh. We, we wanted to discuss this. So, yeah, he's over-rotated just to touch the upper body. He's trying to keep the upper body there in the board just over rotated but this is Dustin just couldn't meet that transition the way he wanted to it was almost too relaxed there yeah it was a tough start to his run but then it really looked like he picked things up and had a lot of good momentum throughout the rest of it so much speed into that yeah. lovely front three there did know, you so trick that top one where there back was... three but it kind of like hit lands yeah there. Yeah, so the two Canadians, down. it looks like Mark McMorris on his 80 ah, point from the first run gas. is going to go through. be interesting to see if Mark's 
score picks up, I think it actually might a little. I think because, you know, that, oh, it, yes, completely, in 86 for Margaret Morris, okay. and of course a 72 for Craven. Big step up for Craven as well. It's, but it's insane. That's some bullshit. Yeah, the, the freestyle elements. Marks yeah, was a very big that's mountain that's first that's run. There wasn't too much freestyle. He added the seven, added the backflip, and he's starting to, well, he's, He's only four points shy of Travis, highest yes. score of the day so far. And that's where the judges reward that risk taking of doing the seven, even though it wasn't quite landed exactly how he wanted to. Okay, so very, very tight between Torstein Horgmo and Sage Kotzenberg at the moment. Torstein leading. Torstein translates in Norwegian as Thunderstone, if you're interested. Really? Yeah, very apt name. Wow. I'm not 100% sure. That's the rough <laughs> translation. <laughs> Oh, beautiful oh, butter! Gosh. Starting things off just absolutely wonderfully into a nice hack. Oh, and this, when, when Torstein's tail feathers up, you know you're in for something special. So barreling along that spine. We've seen people creeping along there. Torstein just letting it run. And it may be loose, but the judges love it when you're riding right on the limit. That's what they want to see. So right on. That truly matters because it shows a mastery of the line that you've chosen and what you're riding. And he's, he's the risk factor there. When you're on a spine going moving that quickly, there's that little 180. So Travis and Torstein both really working the switch. Oh, switch back one right there. Beautiful. Absolute thing of beauty. And then on to that. Holding on. Thought he might be carrying enough speed. Oh, and he's looked straight across at this nose, hasn't he? Okay, what does Torstein have in store for us right now? And he's going big backside 720 and nails it. Okay, switch back one, backside 720, just murking through the top section. This is going to be a very solid run. And he's still got vertical to play with down here. Stretches out a method as he makes his way down onto the apron and across onto the glacier. Okay, things just got real. Torstein just, uh, you know, pushed it into uh, Torstein gear right there. Well, you think in filming terms, you may string two hits together. Very occasionally, someone will get three, but one of them's almost certainly a, se a setup trick. He just put down a full run top to bottom with, we had that butter up at the top. Then you've got that in incredible little uh, front one to switch backside one, and then a back seven down at the bottom. That. That is huge. Sage Kotzenberg is in the pressure cooker right now. Give it, Sage. Headphones are on. He's got some music. I mean, if there is someone that can handle that kind of steam from a pressure cooker, it is Sage Kotzenberg. I mean, he does so well when the heat is turned on. And look at this. He's not holding back at all. We've seen so much pace out of Torstein, out of Travis. They're all starting to pick up on this energy that's going into the venue right now. And Sage really attacking this. That is confidence. And this is just quarterfinals. This is just quarterfinals. <laughs> We've got another two venues to go yet for semis and finals. So you can see bit tracked on the top of this spine now. So he's having to use that heel edge, but he's setting up. Oh, okay. a little bit short, clings to the tail there, creeps into the transition. You can feel how hard he's working, he's out of breath now. And there's, you see the gradient as well, how close the snow is to his chest. It is steep through there. Okay. Confidently boosting into that pocket. And right up again onto the nose of this one. Almost a little pump through there, wasn't it? A couple of turns. This is where Travis was switched, so we know there's a big trick in here. Oh! Back seven, he holds on to it. Little bit of a deck chair, collapsed a tiny bit, but I don't think the judges are going to dock him too much for that. No. Okay, so really intense run, but right now, I think just the technicality, the sheer technicality of Torstein's run is going to pay huge dividends. Yes. I mean, Torstein did just had, you know, what do you have, three hits in his run to Sage's one main hit plus a straight air. You had that really nice butter up at the top as well. Yes. It was a really good little flourish just to wake the judges up. Let's take a look at it. So you see straight off the bat, 
there it is. I mean, this, I think, is one of the strongest runs that we've seen so far today. Yeah, I expect to see this. It's got to be, if it's not in the 90s or close to Travis on 90, I'll be very surprised. That switchback one. Yeah, the switch turns into that. I mean, that is a very consequential uh, just situation right there. And God, just pulling through that back seven. I mean, that was perfect. And that hit was almost, the takeoff on that back seven was almost heel side leaning. You wanted to bite in on your heels. He was going the hard way off his toes there. Oh, excuse me. I'd forgotten about this big back three that Sage did too. So he did have another element and that's massive. It is huge, but you look at that and this backside 720 and he's backseat on both of those landings, really tail heavy. And we've just seen when you've got that direct comparison between him and Torstein, then those landings are going to be a, a point of difference for the judges. Exactly, those nuances are going to be very important. Okay, both men pretty, pretty quiet on this one. Oh. 92 for Torstein Horgmo, 82 for Sage Kotzenberg. Really, um, we both agreed on that. That score had to challenge Travis's 90. <laughs> And we have a new highest score. Torstein Horgmo will advance to the semi-finals where he'll face Mark McMorris. Incredible matchup from those two though. That was really fun to watch. It's one of the heaviest quarter, well, one of the heaviest matchups I think we've seen to date. Very, very big tricks in terrain of consequence. Now into the women's semi-finals second runs. Hannah Beeman versus Zoe sadowski sinop Zoe's in the lead at the moment, but Hunter with so much confidence in this terrain. We saw they're very, very tight. She's on a 76, Zoe on a 78. So Hunter knows it's not going to take much here to push Zoe. Exactly. And she's starting off her run so confidently. I mean, the way that Hannah just flows with this terrain is really remarkable. Well, she's put the time in. And you look at, you talk to any of the big name riders, you look at the likes of Gigi Ruff, of Kevin Jones, Travis Rice himself. It's a couple of seasons before you find your confidence, you find your flow in Alaskan terrain. And that's what you see in Hannah Beeman's riding. Great point, that is so true. Okay, arcing up, looking down this little gun barrel. Airs out of the side of it. Navigating the spine. And now it starts to drop away. Controlling the speed really well through there. Just clipped a little rock there. Back three, beautiful! Oh, that was lovely. Controlled that really, really well. And now she's in that slide debris, I think, that she cut open in the first run. She's come down on that one. So definitely up the freestyle potential there. Oh! And oh. landing the back. Okay, okay, Hannah. I thought for sure as she took off, she'd under-rotated that, and it's a testament to how much she dropped away there and how much speed she took in that she was able to bring it round. Very, very strong run from Hannah Beeman. That is a new highest score in the women's round, 100%. Yeah, she's got to feel so good at that, about that. And the cheers in the corral as she arrives down at the bottom of the run. Holy moly. Yeah, no joke. You know, you can almost hear in the crowd at the bottom, can't you, when it's a kind of sympathy cheer and when it's a, oh my God, you sent this. And that was a, you've sent this. A really nice backflip oh, off a drop. Holy. And then a backflip that she rotated so slowly. And such good composure on the top of the run, navigating down that technical face. Okay, so Zoe Sadowski Sinner grew up on quintessentially Ooh. Southern Hemisphere snow, melt freeze. If you get powder days, it's usually uh, anything over boot deep. So she knows how to ride difficult terrain. She knows how to make bad snow look good. She's in the best snow here. What can she do? And she also just is so strong. Like she can power through tracks like this and it doesn't seem to give her any trouble at all. And it's so, you get the feeling the lines are always direct with Zoe. She won't fluff around terrain. She's just like, I am going here and I'm gonna get there as quick as I can. Yeah. So same spine that we saw Sage on in that last quarter of the men's. She lining up here, double. Cuts that heel edge in, almost white roomed herself there, but deals with it. 
Okay, I'm picking her way down to this section. This was the nose that she pioneered. No one else has been off this. Oh, and she's over Ooh. the front. Oh, and that will have given her a decent hit, I think. Trying to come on. <laughs> you can hear her giggling to herself. She actually fractured the top of her tibia going into this winter in October. She was polishing her double cork tens and someone rode, a punter rode onto the landing in front of her. So she came back off that, but I saw her in the gym rehabbing it and it was as if she'd done nothing. She takes those kinds of things in her stride. Lovely front three. That was oh. very beautiful. Oh no, and going down at the very bottom. I mean, part of this could just be, this is a long run. It's not without an element of exhaustion by the time you're two runs deep and getting to the very end of it. And goes up, she gives it the all clear. So finalist from Alaska in 2021. Her run is done now, and I'd say she may have been leading coming into these second runs, but with Hannah Beeman's performance there, I think this one is gonna be very, very close. Yeah, and we heard Hannah say that she was really looking to up the ante from what she did last year, which was in its right, very impressive. And I think this second run was such a great show from her. Well, exactly. She'd had, if we look at this now, she works this spine up at the top. There's all of the exposure there, but then she's adding the freestyle elements. And that's all of the feedback she would have got from the judges. She holds that so well there. Yeah, and this is where we see the experience that she has riding big mountain lines, riding in Alaska, really come through. Like you said, with with that backflip that she just floats around just perfectly. And from that angle, it looks like she's swimming for, for it for a little bit, but from all of the other angles, she's so smooth. Zoe comes in, abs like as we always see her, with the afterburners on, absolutely smashing her way in here. But then Kills that speed really nicely, actually. A little bit uncharacteristic as she got to the bottom, just having some trouble landing where she, you know, as right here, where she, she usually it. pulls it through. Yeah, she was too far. She, like she leans forward a little bit and she knows it straight away. She's swimming through the bottom of that. She actually picks it up really quickly. Yes, she, she does. may not get too penalized there. It sort of looked worse than it was. So, if you can hear that on the radio, Hannah is on an 83. Zoe Sadowski seen it on a 60. So the difference between the two best run scores is five points. Hannah Beeman will advance to the finals. Zoe Sadowski seen it. The first time she has been in a natural selection contest and not made finals. She is human after all, Mary. <laughs> That's what's so exciting about the Natural Selection Tour. Anything can happen on any given day. Okay, and now we come back to this very tight matchup between the Freeride World Tour veteran, Marion Hayerty. So much experience in big mountain terrain. And she's going up against the pipe maestro, Elena Height. Marion in the lead at the moment. Can she put a full stop, a period on the end of this semi-final matchup with this run. Big drop to start off the top of her run following that line that she took during the first go. And Craven had fallen in that hit in between these, so she had to be careful there. There was a little bomb hole to watch out for, but super direct onto this bowling ball, the terrain all bending out of sight in front of her. She's got to know where she's going. <clears throat> Bounces out of that one. And now, of course, she's into that gut. As you said, Ed, before, it's like watching the amount of vertical that you have and finding those hits still like this one. And backside three. Oh, and she's gone down there as well. And it's so funny, isn't it? You watch some of those runs, like Torstein's, like Mark McMorris's, where they get one hit, two hit, three hit, and then it's all on the confidence is there. You drop one hit, and then you drop the next hit. You drop, and it starts, it all compounds. If it's going yes. good, it'll go great. If it starts going a little bit bad, it can be horrific by the bottom. But Marion, just starting to salvage this a little bit. Interesting she came back to this because we both identified this first run as a really difficult area of the face. Ooh. Oh, she has been worked there. And you can hear that in the audio that's... It, it's the exhausting. air getting driven yes. out of your lungs with okay. every tomahawk. You're kind of landing on your back. This is so physical. Riding, riding these faces, these spines are so physically demanding. And 
These riders are so accomplished and so athletic, but it still takes a toll. Well, I remember when I first, when I watched Bald Face replay for the first time, I actually think the final between Mikkel and Dustin was decided on stamina. By the time they got there, and these Alaskan faces are the biggest ones that the riders are on, and they're certainly the steepest, so it takes the most effort to keep your speed under control. So, right now, as you said, Marianne is in the lead, but the door is open. It's and wide open. <laughs> wide open for Elena Height at this stage. And from the evidence of what we've seen from Elena over the last two stops, if she, like the turn she's putting down, her confidence on her edge, and the one thing you know with Elena is that she's got the tricks. First woman to put a front nine down in the pipe when she was 13 years old. First person ever to put a double rodeo alley-oop in the pipe down in and competition. Taking that, those never been done to become the first woman to drop grizzly spines in Tahoe, a legendary backcountry area just a few years ago. Yeah, and then she's been mentored by Jeremy Jones as she makes that transition into the backcountry. So she's got all of the components there. And her riding is so well-rounded now. It really does feel like it's coming together. Kicks off with a drop off that top nose. And she looks confident at the top of her run. Very, very strong, very, very smooth. I thought she was looking at this. She, she's not looking at that diving board, is she? Off the side of it. Oh! And couldn't get the toe edge in. And she just barely flopped into that pocket. You heard the whoomph of air as she took that one. Organs first. Found her composure again, though. Looks like she's got some nice turns there yeah. just to settle herself. That's a nice line. Navigating this very technical section with the plum right now. Yeah. She heads into... She needs something here, though. She yeah. needs a statement if she's going to want to give... Oh, Big she drop. Goes... Oh. Interesting, that was... She goes back to the spot where she hesitated last time. Now she knows that part of the face. She's opted to get in there. She's on top of a lot of exposure here. Coming down the side of it, a couple of quick turns. Ooh. A little bit of snow release. She navigated the bottom of that spine very well, I think, after that. But, but what we can't hide from here is the fact that that run is very similar to that big mountain style run we saw from Hannah Beeman on going down on the back three as well. Hannah Beeman took that style of spine riding, and it, no matter how impressive it is, unless you have the freestyle elements, you're not going to score. And Elena there, I would say, has failed to reel in Marion Haerty. She got given an opportunity. Marion wasn't able to better that first run score, and it meant that Elena still had a window of opportunity, but it hasn't worked out for her. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think the, the first run scores are very potentially gonna hold for these two. Yeah, I can't see either of those upping. Interesting, isn't it? Because it shouldn't have been about stamina here at this stage, but that's what it looked like. Well, I really think it is, you know, these runs are long and it's really navigating deep snow, landing into powder. I mean, this is, you know, very exhausting. And you can't underestimate the fact that there's a long wait between the runs. So all of that adrenaline that you've built up in the first run is just starting to seep out. That's a really, really good point. You can see, I love this section at the bottom. It's beautiful, but... Without the freestyle elements, i.e. a backside 360. I, yeah, I agree. I think what she was going for had a lot of potential, but just without landing that, that's a, a ding. Yeah, it's, it's the classic case. How many times have we seen it? A natural selection. The run's right there at your fingertips, but it slips through them. So Marion's 74 from the first run will be the score that counts. And she will face Hannah Beeman in the final. We can go down onto the snow now, though, to catch up with T-Bird. He's got all the news about our next venue. Thanks, guys. We just got done with men's quarterfinals and women's semifinals. We are going to heli bump over to this adjacent slope and get men's semifinals underway. However, the women's finals is set. It'll be Hannah Beeman versus Marion Herity. 
And in the men's semifinals, it's going to be Ben Ferguson versus Travis Rice in a head-to-head and Mark McMorris versus Torstein Horgmo. So we got helis waiting for us. The light's good in Alaska. We got to go back to you guys. Thank you, T-Bird. We're going to get stuck into the semifinals very shortly. But before we do, it's all about getting high in the mountains, and that means altitude and latitude. Those are the areas most affected by climate change, and that is why natural selection has a drive for sustainability. When we were starting the natural selection tour, you know, the whole core team, it was never, you know, a question on if we should or shouldn't lean into sustainability. It was an absolute. I've spent most of my life in the outdoors. In the mountains, we get to see climate change happening in real time. I've been in Alaska for nearly 20 years. It's pretty apparent that glaciers have been receding. I've, I've watched them recede. Areas that we used to, for example, go do crevasse rescue training or ice climbing, um, we're having to travel another quarter mile up the road to access the same ice. 70 centimeters of new snow. As mountain guides and, and skiers and snowboarders and just outdoor recreationalists, I think it's really important to pay attention to what's going on in our climate because this is the place we call home. This is the place that we go to seek solace and enjoyment. And I think we're in a real place of privilege to be able to forget about it for moments when people globally are struggling with the effects of climate change and it's only gonna get worse for them and for us. So it's part of our responsibility just as humans to care about each other and care about the place we live. So I think paying attention to what's happening and doing our part to uh, take care of the environment is extremely important. Anybody who recreates outdoors, anybody who lives in a city, anybody on this earth needs to care about climate change because it affects all of us. And, you know, in natural selection, we've always been really focused at trying to, you know, continue to support the relationship that we have with these wild places. And it would be hypocritical when bearing all of those factors in mind to then partner up with companies who have no environmental sensibilities. And that's why the relationships with both TAE and Yeti are so important to natural selection. It's really about taking a holistic approach to protecting the places that we love to play and spend time in. Okay, time for a quick break. When we come back, we've got men's semis. He's coming off such a juicy first round. Little tailwind. <laughs> and this, I mean, look, that is literally a five to six hundred foot drawn out arc. Ooh. Wow. That's stunning. Huge front three, all boned out with joy. It wasn't an easy takeoff. It's got a double transition up the face of that, and then he's, he's having fun. He's motoring over that into this little gap again. Hung up, but I really like the gap. Love his toe side cars, too. They just look so, so flowy. It's like he wants another piece of this treacherous blind takeoff. <laughs> oh my wow. God. Oh my god. Holding it together. I, uh, yeah, I mean, I can't say it enough. Uh, take chances, risk and reward. Uh, back five, landing blind, landing switch in soft snow is incredibly difficult. He's got to be feeling pretty good about that right now, heading into this uh, lower part where he can just kind of uh, cruise a bit. And I love that he can just mock home on switch. Wow. Yes. Sparky, a true appreciator of good snowboarding. Too. Welcome back to the Yeti Natural Selection here in the Alaskan backcountry. It's men's semi-finals time and we're changing venues. We're not moving too far though. We're still on Montrachet, which is the big pyramid in front of the base camp but we're working down the lookers left-hand side of the venue now. So as you look at this whole pyramid, 
We've been working on the right hand side here, and we're now going to shift across to what are known as spines six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Little less rocky features, but it looks way more playful out there, Mary. Yeah, this is, it's all technical, but this is even more kind of convoluted with spines and options among the spines right there. It's going to be very exciting. Okay, we can take a closer look at it now with the GoPro course preview. We've got the GoPro Hero 10 mounted to the drone and you get these spectacular views. And this is exactly what the riders are using to scope. So it gives you a good view over all of these features from every direction. Huge spine down the middle of this face. I mean, this is so incredibly technical. You see the exposed rocks on the riders right on the other side. And one of the things that these riders are all forced to think about in this is not just the hit right in front of you, but the next hit and the next hit, because you need to be able to really properly land, set the edge you want into that next area. Travis refers to that as edge crushing, doesn't he? The best riders will look at a piece of terrain and think, okay, if I'm spinning a back three off that, I need to land heel heavy so that I don't waste time getting onto my heel edge and then tracking across to the next feature. Exactly as you say, thinking two, three steps ahead. And it's, it's so, so detailed. The finesse that you see in the riding is absolutely breathtaking. And this terrain provides the ultimate challenge and in the brackets, we've got two really interesting groups of riders. It feels to me like we've got very much a big mountain Alaska semi-final, and then we've got a much more freestyle orientated semi-final. I would totally agree. As you mentioned, we have Ben Ferguson and Travis Rice, the first matchup, and that's that big mountain Alaska vision semis. And then Mark McMorris and Torstein Hargmo, when you said bringing in that kind of even more freestyle emphasis. But then, as we saw, Torstein and Mark, they both box very, very clever. They're consummate competitors, but they've got big mountain smarts. Yes. Like they didn't, like both of them had breathtaking runs to make it into the semis. The one thing that's sure, we're going to have a final with a real Alaska head and a real slope style head. But they've got to get through the semi finals first. And a fresh face means they've all got to, as we called it in the first run, range find again. They, they've not got any tracks, they've not got any speed indicators here. They've got to really work on that visual inspection and know exactly where they're going and critically what they want to do. Yes, it's a blank slate as we head into Ben Ferguson's first semi-final run. Absolutely love Ferg's riding. As a pipe rider, he had that really eclectic run, sort of backside 360 with a switch method in it, into that switch McTwist. Oh, completely. Ben Ferg has a forceful finesse with every turn that he makes. And we saw that in bold face. He pulled out that samurai sword of a frontside 360 oh, yeah. mid face. So interesting, he's using that same in point that we saw from Marion and Dustin Craven. Easy backside 360 right there. He windmilled it, didn't he? Just let all of the cadence carry him. So smooth and just effortless looking. So coming out right onto the left-hand side of this venue, working his way down spine number six. And looking light on his feet oh. there. Just making a very technical spine look playful. <laughs> As he rolls up to this crux point, he's heading out right onto the edge here and make wow. no mistake, there is exposure off the backside of that. He is setting a flag right now. What an interesting and pretty incredible line choice. Yeah, but it's we've said it so many times. It's Big Mountain. Where's the freestyle? Oh, there it 360. is. 360. That was enormous. Big front three nose bone. Stale fish oh, onto that transition beautiful. perfectly. Just finding that landing just so perfectly. Oh, and this is so graceful. Beautiful, elegant riding from Ben Ferguson. Hacks into that big turn and lets out a scream of elation at the bottom. Wow, I mean, he is just looking over his shoulder at Travis Rice right now, saying, hey, it's on, it's on. And there was that crouch. You see that when he does his carve and butter runs through the pipe, he got low. Looks like a stingray in full flight. <laughs> wow. And that's no sympathy cheer from the crowd no. at the bottom. They're celebrating this one. That was classic Ferg right there. That was a beautiful run. What, that, it's, you've got to check yourself and put this run in context for a second. That was a contest run, it's not a film run. First tracks down a brand new venue. Oh yeah, I mean, that is, that is the heart of what we can only hope to see. That is aspirational riding right there. Okay, Travis Rice has had the 
bit between his teeth today. He's on a mission. We've seen some of the most breathtaking contest riding ever committed to film here today. What's he going to back it up with in the semi-finals? OK. Oh, big drop to start his runoff. OK. And you've got to say, Travis has got 12, 14 years in Alaska, no longer, probably 15, 16 years in Alaska under his belt. He knows how to read this terrain. Big frontside 360, landed that very strong. He looks so powerful at the moment, doesn't he? There's almost a, a sense of redemption after he missed out on Alaska last year. Linking that. The thing about watching Travis ride this line right now is that it doesn't look like it's his first go on it. It looks oh. like he's familiar with it. It's really, really wild. He didn't oh. compress that last landing. The tail met the transition perfectly and he just rode on like he hadn't left the ground. Okay, this, <laughs> Travis is just nailing this right now. Wow, beautiful back one right there. Well, that phrase, a rising tide raises all boats, is never more applicable than here. Each of oh. these riders, with every single run, it seems like they're just, the, the level, the session is just heating up. Yeah, they really are just feeding off of one another right now. Pops and he's going to get another hit in right there. Switch with a switch. Five. Oh, my gosh. OK. What? OK, we, we have raised the bar again for the runs today. What I mean, is happening? Ben's run was incredible. And Travis said, OK, I see your run. And I'm going to raise you with, you know, half a dozen tricks. <laughs> oh, uh, that, that's the best contest run I've ever seen. Absolutely incredible. Two riders, immaculate runs top to bottom. The judges are going to be quaking in the booth right now. We're good. <laughs> you are good. You're really, really, really good. Where do we start, Mary? I, my head is just has exploded. That was incredible. Both of these guys just put down fairly immaculate runs, especially for their first go in this new side of Montrachet. It's Ben Ferguson just sits down. He gets his center of gravity low. Oh, look how big that was and so stylish holding onto that grab. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's going in your film part if you do that. The stalefish transfer there met that perfectly. Travis oh kicked gosh. off with that spindly little drop to start with, then the front three. Just really stunning. The tail grab. The back three, then the back flip. Meets that and then sets up with that little hop round, the front side 180. Oh, sorry, back one. And then into a meta. And you see one thing worth noting, as we see... What? <laughs> but there's there's two time. things that I missed in there. I was so busy waxing lyrical about other parts of the run that I'd missed that backside 180 in the first run. This is... Ben, where, do, where do the judges eight, go five, with this score? Eight, five. Travis, run one, 92, nine, Wow. Two. So equal score with Torstein from the quarterfinals. And this is the same day, so we're working on the same scale of judging. Travis Rice matches Torstein Horgmo's score. Ben Ferguson on a very respectable 85. And for Travis <laughs> to have two of the highest scoring runs of the day. You disappeared and then you just backflipped over the ridge. It was insanity. <laughs> That's an incredible place for Travis to be sitting right now. Back up to the top and there is no respite. We have another head-to-head -head that looks like a final. Mark McMorris versus Torstein Horgmo, two of the biggest slope-style heavyweights of the noughties and tens, suddenly find themselves in the Alaska backcountry, going head-to-head -head in the Yeti natural selection. Mark McMorris first to drop. I mean, this is where fantasy leagues become a reality. Mark McMorris versus Torstein Horgmo in the Alaskan backcountry. <laughs> That's <laughs> insane. Okay, so Mark getting in early onto this big plateau just straight lining it, pinning it down there. Oh, a beautiful butter. <laughs> just holding on to it. Ambassador, you're spoiling us. Look at that, and then right out onto the nose of this. Super technical. Billy goating his way through there. Right up on top again. But Morris has made a real statement about his big mountain credentials here. 
Oh, yeah. He's navigating the spine so well right now and just popping a really easy backside 360 right there before going cross court. And he did get the tail grab on it. We haven't had many big, solid, confident grabs today, and I think that means a lot. Well, I think that's one thing definitely in going, oh, into a front side three, holding on no problem right there, is that in this kind of terrain, I mean, usually you would see these riders in a video part in a contest really getting to kind of hold on and yank that grab for an extended period of time, but this kind of terrain makes that so much more difficult. <gasps> oh my Back five goodness. and he holds on! He has to revert out of it, but he held on through that. The judges aren't going to punish him for that, I don't think. Okay, so this is a great run. He has that top, very technical section. The crowd rejoices, and then a litany of solid freestyle hits in the lower section. That ha it, that really was a tiramisu run, wasn't it? It's got a little bit of everything in it. Some super, super tech riding up at the top. And then some spicy freestyle down at the bottom. Definitely pressure put on Torstein now. Oh, Mikel Bang, the cheer, leading the cheerleaders at the back shit. there as well. That is good. But now we have a Norwegian destroyer, Torstein Horgmo. So talented, so good under pressure, and so strong. He's proved it in Jackson Hole. He's proved it in Boldface. Fourth and fifth places, respectively. And now he's into the semi final places. He can beat Mark McMorris here. He's on for a natural selection, best ever finish. You see that strategy right there going front one into some very nice switch turns right there. And we know that the judges will be salivating over this. This is exactly what they want to see. And that's where you see, oh, he's going cab five right there. And this is where we see the nature of Torstein's ability to to compete and strategize really, really come through because it's been years since he's been in a bib and it really suits him just great still. Okay, so he's got a heavy top section there. What's he gonna do as he makes his way down into this exposure at the bottom? He's got a big diving board to play with here. Doubles, uses that as a lily pad in the middle. Beautiful line choice. Frontside oh! 720, what? Okay, he is putting the pressure on McMorris right now. This is video game stuff. This doesn't happen. You can't do this in a single run. A beautiful what? method into a wonderful butter. Like Wonder a oh, pretzel oh, butter out of a heel side turn into a backside oh, nose butter. Torstein Horgmo has just gone absolutely ham. This is arguably not just some of the best contest riding Alaska's ever seen. This might be some of the best oh, yeah. riding. Alaska has ever seen a top to bottom run. No one has ever put a, a run like that on film before. People are losing their minds at the bottom here. Oh my glove. I feel like a bit of my brain's just come out of my nose. Like my mind is melting from yeah, this matchup. I am totally with you. I think expectations were high going into watching this and they just were fully exceeded, melted down, set fire to and thrown away. I mean, Mark McMorris navigating that spine was a thing of beauty. And then he, as you said, spices it up at the bottom. I mean, that was a solid enough run on its own. And then Torstein answers back. So from one into that pocket, links it after all those switch turns to that cab five, and that is bolts. He's standing up on top of that. But the front seven, you think he's maybe done on this one. Look at the landing. I mean, that was that last two seven crazy. Two. And the method was beautiful. I mean, look at that method. But this might be my favorite, that heel side turn into the butters. That was everything. You had a little bit of everything you want from a video part run that hit, in that. Uh, okay. Peacock. Connor and Amazing. Sandy in the yeah. judges booth now are going to be backing themselves into a corner Crazy. because to me that's yeah, high 90s. Yeah, cool. Oh, I can see it. Got to be above 95. <laughs> Travis, I think, had six yeah, really big yeah. hits. If you count the little yeah. 180 yeah. setup, it's right. seven tricks. Torstein's even. The for switch me. turns, the butter. Oh, you're the switch everything. turns. Zero. Run one, Torstein, 95. Ooh. 95. Oh. Exactly where we thought it would be. He's, the judges had to leave themselves somewhere to go, but they had to reward that high score of the day so far for Torstein Horgmo. 
Mark McMorris with it all to do second run. And it's so interesting too because Travis and Torstein aren't competing against each other. They haven't yet, but of course they're going one for one with that top score. <sighs> On either side of the draw as well. Now, before we go into the second runs of the semi-finals, we're going to catch up with Skiddo and find out why it is such an important machine to access the backcountry. Skidoo's are really important if you're a backcountry snowboarder. Skidoo is kind of the necessity for, for the type of snowboarding we do. One of the best ways to access the mountains for snowboarding. Like if you go to Whistler, every truck has a skidoo on the back almost, you know, so a great way to access the mountains. You can get to some insane terrain. Makes travel so much easier and quicker. And I've had a skidoo for 19 years and it's just been a game changer. In my line of work, my profession, how important is having a skidoo? You know, look, it's like a cowboy, frankly, without a horse. I think it is sort of like a necessity as a backcountry snowboarder and a, and a pro snowboarder. So addicted to sledding. It's like kind of the, the highlight of the season is getting out there on like long sled days. One thing she's talked about in the past is that she kind of has to tone herself down a little bit because she hasn't competed a lot and, and the adrenaline will get to her. And she's like, I'm working on kind of controlling that so that I can just execute what I want to be riding. Yeah, you can see she oversiked a little bit right there, but I don't think that is going to affect her too. There's a lot of room in both of these uh, scores between Robin and Zoe, there's, there's room. I want to see if Robin's going to go for that uh, massive cliff again. She's putting her turns in the right places. You know, Robin is a back-to-back -back video part of the year winner. She's been a rider of the year. And she has continually made a mark in the backcountry for not only women riders, but for snowboarders in general. And I think her performance here today only continues to solidify her as a leader in this type of terrain. Ah, I was about to say, there we go. Is she gonna take it back to the top one more time? There's still some redemption left. Oh, this is exciting. Relentless. This is why we love RVG. Oh! oh my gosh, and she rides away. That is, that is just a cherry on top of her run. <laughs> that was burly. Yeah, you could see it. It took everything that she had to stomp that. And we're giving her the stomp, right? I mean, the... no, that was full stomp. I mean, she washed out in some, uh, you know, in some kind of old sloughed, poor snow quality below, which, which. It's going to affect her score a little, but um, the, yeah, the cliff is clear. You can hear her breathing hard. <laughs> wow. Solid, solid run from Robin. I just, you know, whenever you, when you, when you meet Robin, you just, and you hang out with her. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> I think what you're going for is Robin loves snowboarding. Yes. She absolutely loves it. And that bleeds through. You see it when you watch her ride. It's awesome. Welcome back to the Yeti Natural Selection here in the Alaskan backcountry where Quite frankly, the level of snowboarding has been put into the stratosphere. Now, there's something that's really important to the snowboarding industry as a whole that we need to mention at this point, and that is the Natural Selection Industry Alliance. And what this does, the aim of it is to support the core brands at the heart of snowboarding and give them a platform to promote themselves. 
You can see all of the different brands in here. There's some of the biggest brands in snowboarding and some of the smaller brands that you might not have heard of. Uh, one of the brands that we want to put a spotlight on today is Beyond Medals. Started out by Kevin Backstrom and Tor Lundstrom when they left the Swedish Olympic team. It focuses on exactly this kind of snowboarding. They put out some brilliant edits. Go and search out Relapse online. And they put together some really good limited edition snowboards with Battalion. And they've got a really rad range of apparel. Right now, though, it's time to get stuck into the semi-finals. Ben Ferguson is going head to head with Travis Rice. Travis has laid down a 92. Ben Ferguson has it all to do. And he can do it, Mary. He totally can. He is such a forceful rider who also just is so yeah, elegant in his snowboarding. And if he can put this together top to bottom, he could definitely upset the current order of things. Okay, so it looks like he's gonna take that same line in through that little shot there. Lovely transfer oh, into a rock wow, ride. Oh, that was awesome. You can just hear the tail dragging down that rock. And just snagging a back three right there before heading into this long stretch. Well, we know that Travis put seven tricks into this, so that's exactly what Ben's thinking. I've got to up this trick count. Yeah, he's got his work cut out for him, but he, you know, is one that can really tackle that challenge. And it's so inviting when you look away to your right into the shaded side here, but he knows if he gives into temptation and ends up on that side of the face, then you end up in the gully and all the features dry up. So he's staying high up on this spine. Beautiful little poke off the nose of that rock. And front side seven, putting that down just so well. Oh, into a beautiful back one. Oh, and he just sat down, I think, and had to revert that one out. What a run again! We've seen another breathtaking run. Just the level of consistency these riders are putting oh, in. Look at that front side hack, too. That was awesome. Just a detonation on that last little feature there. And at the behest of the crowd down at the bottom, he throws in a little butter. Oh, Mikel Bang, Dustin Craven, Holy straight in with the high fives. Wow, that front seven. Heavy, heavy hits and the backside 180 Japan down at the bottom. I mean, that was such a stylish trick. So considered, but it's challenging because there's room. There's room for Travis right there. He already has a 92. Does that best that? I don't know. Probably not. Probably not. Is the honest answer right now. It's it's a big, big ask. Travis has laid down one of the greatest runs in Alaskan snowboarding. Yes, like the, 100%. Alongside Torstone, just gets a quick little fist bump with Mark McMorris there before dropping in. See for some Pacificos, baby. <laughs> Calling out the Apre before okay. he even drops in. I mean, he's surely feeling good. He's got that 92 to sit on, but of course, knowing Travis, he's not one to lay back on anything. Well, that was a flat landing. He really had to judge his speed carefully there, not to overshoot that. So he's got one drop up at the top there. Little cheeky backside 180, setting up for that same hit that we saw Torstein on. Oh, and, and the go, cab fight. Yeah, yeah, solid, solid strategy so from good, baby. Rice right there. And, and he's it, feeling good. It should have been toe heavy for him. He had to kind of lay light off his heels there to get into that super technical takeoff. What? Oh, oh man. Front side wow. 540 off that diving board. So he's riding switch now and through the bottom of this face. Just opening up a whole new zone. Whoa! <laughs> Cab three! And just a little hot butter out. Okay, Travis Rice is on one right now. Where? where? I, I don't know what to say. This is just. These words sort of start running out at this point <laughs> because we're in uncharted territory. No one's ever laid this kind of consistency down over a face this side with, size, this, with this intensity of tricks. Everything that comes to mind it just feels inadequate. Madness, crazy, ridiculous. It's beyond that. It's, this is genius. I mean, look at them. They're ripping the banners out. 
<laughs> the crowd is frothing right now. But I think, you know, looking at this diligently, that was a great run from Travis on its own. That would have been fantastic, but it's not his first run. No, it's his second. Like, but he's not cracking too, like too, not too many of those takeoffs were built in. I suppose no. he had Torstein's hit. But the, he was coming into Torstein's hit, soft, like that, that should have been a toe edge hit and he was coming off his heels. Like there's, there's a lot of technicality to read into all of this. This was yes. beautiful, the rock tap. I mean, like, any of these runs bar none could advance someone on its own, but then going against each other, the level just keeps getting raised so significantly. It's just the consistency and the, the ability these guys have got to link that to chuck a front seven. Look at that, spots the landing, boom, straight in. Killing a front side 720 like that is so difficult. Oh, completely. And his landing sits back on the tail and then, oh gosh. He's just a tiny bit heel edge heavy, isn't he? And Travis, look at him. Look how fired up he is. There's that. That's the really hard cab five. And he did so well to bring that round. But this, again, front five, landing switch on a front side rotation. And look at how deep he goes, the amount of distance he covers top to bottom on that. And his back arm there as he lands is perfectly placed. Cab three to that little hop round. Then the butter. <laughs> right, they've started to calm down a little bit now, but Travis Rice, I've got to say, he's in a league of his own at the moment. It feels like both Travis and Torstein on either side of the draw are just breathtaking. 97 for Travis, 88 for Ben Ferguson. So 97 for Travis. Again, we see that best score flip-flopping from Torstein to Travis. They're one-upping each other. At the moment, it feels like destiny that Torstein and Travis meet in the final. Travis has booked his place. And completely, and I called that totally wrong because I was kind of leaning into his first run and that second run, that had that element of bar raising, technical prowess and fluidity that the judges really wanted to see. This is absolutely mind melting. We've got a contest format that is not just progressing what happens in contest, but what happens in snowboarding right now. Yes. It's, it's a really, really, as a snowboarder, it's a wonderful place to be. Mark McMorris, three bronze medals from the Olympics. He turned up after Supernatural and Ultra Natural, where he got his first taste of backcountry freestyle. He came back to this format eight years later and took the first ever natural selection in Jackson Hole. Now he finds himself in Alaska going yeah. up against Torstein Hogmo, a man who is in the form of his life. And worth yeah. noting too that we haven't brought up before is that sure. Mark spent the better part of this season hitting park jumps. Like it's not like he was in the backcountry readying himself for the natural selection tour. He had to worry about a whole other contest. So. This, this is him shifting his focus and having really no problem at all doing that. Okay, he's got to beat a 95. It is going to take, let's not make any bones about this, a oh. very, very special run. Huge butter up the top. Clicks around to switch. So he's taking a leaf out of Torstein and Travis's book with the cab five. Oh, oh. and over the bars. Travis and Torstein haven't they haven't, it's not that they haven't put a foot wrong, they haven't put a hair out of place right. on those runs. And it means that, that cleanliness is next to godliness up here. Completely, to have runs that are that clean, I mean, this is just flabbergasting, it's, it's, it's immaculate. It's that lovely wildcat. Getting caught he, up a little bit right there on his toe edge. Looked like he was trying to get barreled. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, and going front three, holding it together. Oh, not quite. Imagine having the spatial awareness to be able to save something like that. Oh, any, yeah. more, any mortal would have had their head in the snow yeah. <laughs> on that one. And somehow he gave it the sprocking cat and managed to bring it round. <sighs> Pop and a half cap for the fans down at the bottom. Yeah, you get the feeling, I think after that, that hit on the cab five, I think Mark almost let it go at that point. He's like, you know what? I'm not going to take him down here. What a run, though. Dude. 
I have a rock on the way down to the Oh, wow, you nailed a rock. Oh, wow. He's got a big hit on the board there. So back up to the top. Torstein Hogmo. Do you think he's got a point to prove with natural selection, Mary? I think that Torstein has cemented his legacy in snowboarding time and time again, but he continually not reinvents himself, but pushes beyond what he would have to do to be a legend. It's really incredible. And T-Bird has said that he's, he's almost, with his yoga, with his meditation, he's kind of rediscovered himself from the inside out. And we've certainly seen that. His preparation for these events is very different to everyone else. Huge frontside 180 to open. Yes, no, you're completely right. And you see that in his riding. There's so much composure. He is an alpha individual, but he also is incredibly calm and composed. Okay, so big switch turns down here, down the whole face. Butter! Oh, um, butter into a backside three? That Lovely. Was epic. So just upping the difficulty again, looking for ways that he can turbocharge this run from an already impressive 95. He wants Travis's score back off him, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. Where's this going? Lily pad to back one! Building on that, what he did the first run into switch backside three. Hold on to it. Oh, he's gone down hard there. He'd ridden out, I think, far enough, but it's broken the flow. And now big back one. Look at this. This is ambistant snowboarding, isn't it? He's barely showing any preference. And the way he's riding that face. Can flick round regular or goofy. It doesn't seem to make much difference. No, he's... He is just, wow. Oh, the long gun size transition, that one. So it's not going to beat the 95 point score, I don't think. Some really, really good technical riding in there, especially the switch elements, which you can never discount. We've seen the judges prioritizing those. But that 95. I was knee kneeing myself in the face for a bit. Are you okay? Yeah. Oh, I really hope that doesn't affect him at all. Wow. So, Mark McMorris started this run off beautifully, had that huge butter up at the top, and then going for the cab five. And just having a bit of trouble on the landing, unfortunately, and that's what's hard. As you said, it's like he knows what he's up against from that first run score. It's challenging when you, you know, the riding is at this level, having any sort of uh, bobble at all is such a disadvantage. Well, and you said it, it's, oh, he did so well to hold on to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's, he's an incredible snowboarder, such amazing air awareness, and he almost pulled that through. And you said he knew what he was up against. And I think Torstein knew what he was up against. Yes. Like, we, we're getting very, very close to perfection here. Yeah, it's... Let's, let's not beat around the bush. Like, Torstein's previous run and Travis's best run, these are... This is the best snowboarding anyone has ever seen in Alaska. It's, it's backcountry freestyle at its very best. Torstein Hogmo, second highest score of the day so far. Let's see what these second run scores come in at. Gut feeling, Mary, that they, neither of them are going to best those first run scores. I completely agree with you. All right, Sandy, let's hear scores. Here they come. Score, Mark Morris Mark, one, nursing two, that board. Seven, six. So 76 Forside, for Mark McMorris. Okay, yeah. Winner, As we suspected, one, first run scores will stand. Torstein Hogmo will meet Travis Rice in the final. Time now, though, to throw down to Tom Monteroso. He's been watching everything from the glacier. Let's see what he made of it. Well, the stage is set here for finals. The vibe was through the roof here in the Ryder Corral, as all the riders that did not advance on to semifinals were basically partying here on the glacier. Montreche treated us incredibly well. We're having a blast out here on the glacier. On to finals, we got Travis Torstein, Hanna, Marion. Can't wait to see what happens. Back to you guys. Thanks, T-Bird. Great insight from the Glacier. Good to know that the atmosphere was just as pumped as it was here in the commentary booth. 
The riders hunkered down for the night because tomorrow is a new venue and it is finals day. We'll be joining them for those last showdowns, Hannah Beeman versus Marion Hayati and Torstein Horgmo versus Travis Rice after the break. As his brother Craig always calls him, the closer. Yeah, if there's someone you don't want to leave uh, leave a window open for or anything, it's or, this guy. Yeah, or make just a little, just make him a little angry. Yeah. One of the nicest guys in snowboarding, but uh, yeah, don't don't bum him out if you're competing against him. <laughs> yes, there we go. Wow. That's that that rhythm section. I love it. The, the cliff drop into the double cross court air. Those turns are gorgeous as he comes into the shadows here. Just step down. Yeah, definitely motoring through some compromised snow. But. Stomped. There we go. Maybe not quite as juicy as his first one, but oh, it looks like oh, he wants back this to the again. scene of the crime. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! god. <laughs> that was oh nuts! Oh my god! And he, you saw, he just said, "Okay, I just got to pull up on the speed just a hair, so I don't land out in the flats." He took that wow. landing. That landing was not given. He, uh, he grin and bared through it. And he made it look casual, you know? Into trying to set a new land speed record. <laughs> see that aerodynamic? Did it, you see the way he left the drone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Welcome back to the Yeti natural selection here in the Alaskan backcountry. New day, new venue. This is Spinal Tap. It's a venue that has a slightly steeper maximum gradient than we saw on Montrachet yesterday, but overall, it's ever so slightly more gentle. Uh, weather's looking pretty interesting today, Mary. Yes, not quite the perfect bluebird conditions we had in quarters and semis for the women, but it is partly cloudy, about 10 degrees Fahrenheit, so chilly out there, negative 12 Celsius. But the big thing is that we have a front about to move in. Yeah, it's classic Alaska. The highs and the lows can move very, very quickly. Close proximity to the coast, a lot of humidity in the air. And when a storm this big starts to roll in, you have to get out quickly. Otherwise, the riders could face being trapped up here for the next week. But it does mean that we've got a milky light looking forward, Mary. What does that mean for the riders? Because there's not many points of reference when visibility gets low here. That's a really great point because without any trees here, trees don't really grow on these faces because the snowfall makes it an inhospitable environment for them. And so without light and shadows being cast, then it's very hard to see the nuances in terrain. That flat light can really make things more challenging. A great time when Oakley Prism lenses really can come in handy. Check you out. Okay, let's take a look at the course. This is Spinal Tap. Such a myriad of roots on here. Peak sits at 3,516 feet or just over 1,000 meters. Same exact vertical as Montrachet, uh, 1,100 feet or 335 meters. The max gradient, 34 degrees. Average gradient, 27 degrees. And the length, another whopper at 650 meters. I mean, really the ideal place to take it to 11 for finals day. It's got so much potential, hasn't it? These are the drone shots with the GoPro Hero 10 strapped to it that give us a closer look. And this is what the riders are using to try and scope these lines and work out exactly what laces together. Obviously taken on a perfect bluebird day here in the backcountry. But again, we just see these highly, highly technical opportunities for riders to navigate, to launch off of, to really find their way down these faces as creatively and with as much finesse as possible. And we've got a lot of exposure here at the top off this knoll if you want to get kind of tricky and mountain goatee, but then you've got this huge ridge across in front of us. You can see so many transitions. It's almost the biggest challenge facing the riders here is actually finding the route that you want, like committing to one because there are so many options. Completely. This is the stuff that Video Park dreams are made of. 
And on the ground at the bottom of Spinal Tap, we have our third member of our announcing crew, T-Bird. Let's hear from him. Thanks, guys. It's finals day. We got Travis Rice versus Torstein Horgmo, Hanna Beeman versus Marion Herdy, who will be crowned champion up here in Alaska. And also, don't forget, at the end of today, we're also going to crown an overall tour champion. So uh, stick with us. It's going to be a banger. Thank you, T-Bird. Now, look at this bracket. The top four in the overall coming into this have been knocked out in the quarterfinals. Bang, Elston, Craven, and Kotzenberg. Ferguson and McMorris knocked out in the semis, couldn't win the overall, which means that both Travis and Torstein have a shot at the title. Mikel Bang's performances in Baldface and Jackson could yet see him take the overall. And on the women's side, we have a similar situation where it's still multiple people in the running for that overall title. Of course, in the finals, we have Hannah Beeman versus Marianne Erdy. And if Hannah wins, that lines up Elena, who is in fourth place overall to take the overall title. If Marion wins, she will also become the overall tour champion for 2022. So much still to pay for here at the Yeti Natural Selection in the Alaskan backcountry. So a spinal tap, the third and final venue. And our first final is the women's. 39-year-old Hannah Beeman. She's, she's plied her trade all over the States from Big Bear through Jackson up in the Pacific Northwest. And she's going up against Marion Hayati, who grew up in Shamroos, one of the epicenters of border cross in Europe. But she then settled in with the Freeride World Tour skiing crew in Chamonix. Made herself very at home in steep terrain. First though, it's Hannah Beeman to open up Spinal Tap. So a couple of nice, easy turns in at the top here, just getting a feel for the snow. Uh, it looks so looks nice the there too right now. You can see her reevaluating okay. her line at the beginning. You hear her thanks to that mic'd up cam. There's actually a little more light than I thought there would be as well. There's still plenty of shade there. Opening up the route, but getting a little stopped up, and that definitely could be a play with the light. 100%. It looked like there she hadn't quite read that. That's she... been a good snow. There you go. Okay. Maybe potentially it was the snow then. Okay, finding a nice line on top of that spine right now. Steps down and over that ridge, and then she's got another diving board there. Nice little front side air. Solid melon. There's that random tree in the middle of the face as well. Look at that thing. Straight off the front. Down, another front side air. Landed very clean. So going very tidy at the moment. Just hopping through that section. We're really making nice work of the spine, as you said, really putting down just such solid free ride element to this line. Um, but what we don't want to see here is that same trap that she got sucked into in 2021, where she laid down an incredibly technical free ride run, but lacked the freestyle. But maybe, like, where's Marion going to go with this? That's the big question. She's the one with the free ride pedigree. So now that she's putting some, it's a really playful line. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> you can <laughs> Tapping hear, the yes, back leg. You can hear the exertion. Hannah, one of the most talkative riders on course. It's awesome. Yeah, trying to get the lactic acid out of the quad muscle there. You can Wonderful. see. But that was good, Beta. That was good, Beta. Just what Hannah said, I think that was, again, Hannah is such a strong snowboarder. That was definitely her in like a third or fourth gear. She has a couple more gears that she could turn it up to. Exactly, and we heard her say that. That one was for experience. Yes. Don't bite yourself off, keep yourself in the game and make it pay for the second run. But Marion Hayati with a really good opportunity here to use that line, use what she saw there and yes. try and get the big first run score in the bag. That's one of the things about both of these riders that they are so good at route finding and navigating and really reading the face of any terrain they're dropping into. So that's a very incredible matchup. And that's what I was alluding to. The time that Marion spent in Chamonix with all of the big name Freeride World Tour skiers means that she's got that skill set down pat. She knows how to find three or four big features that will link a run together. 
And that was such a nice start right there with that drop to that toe side turn. It was just really quite nice. And then, of course, we see her following that same line that Hannah took on her run, of course, just navigating that spine. And it's, I tell you what, the judges don't want to see those hit-for-hit -hit follows from riders. It, they see it as, basically, you diminish the entire risk category. And you can hear, it is crunchy on that sunny side of that spine. It's definitely sun-affected. Yeah, that's a really, really good point, is that Hannah opening up that segment is going to bode well for her. OK, so looking for something here. A couple of really nice turns, but yes, she's following. It's like for like. Oh, From there we three. go. There Holds we go. Holds on to it. And that's, that's one of those things. Not many people know it, but Marianne actually competed in slopestyle and made a good play to try and get to Sochi in 2014. She has got some freestyle smarts. And if you go and troll through the archive, you'll find some park edits. And she had a mean backside rodeo on her for a while. So it's not a case of Marion learning freestyle tricks. It's more a case of dusting them off and applying them to big mountain terrain. Totally. And that was so strategic of her building upon her competitor's run in that way. But as you said, taking that same line, I mean, Woo! all of these factors, I don't envy ah! Connor and Sandy as they yeah! kind of work this through right now for this first round of women's finals. Yeah, they've got a lot of work to do here. Let's take another look at Hannah's. Breaking got... trail right here on on this face. You know, she she was getting in grabs. She had multiple solid uh, front side grabs, but not as much of the variation, I'm sure, as she wanted. But as she said, it was this was a beta gathering, so there's no doubt that she's going to be turning it up for her next run. And you can't underestimate that breaking trail. Here we see Marion. She had a couple of beautiful turns up at the top, but that was the only time she deviated from Hannah's line. The front three is a big feather in her cap, but it's the only differentiation, and she's following a track. I'm fascinated by this one. I honestly, in the, if you were measuring it purely on technicality, then I think Marion might be out in front, but I think Hannah could take this one. Yes, I agree. I just think the way that she rode that spine and opened it up is going to bode well. Nice. But Marion's also sitting there and saying, okay, oh, well, so I see what you're doing. Oh, I'm going to add on to it. Yeah, but that, that's literally like slipstreaming someone to the finish and then sneaking the past them. On that, right? Yeah. Side. I was like, uh oh, I hope it's going to be not like this. Yeah. On the run. Interesting like hearing them talk up. about that. They, I think it's going to be very, very clear for the women's second runs and the men's first runs. 75, 75. Marion, 82, 82. Oh. Interesting. Very interesting. It means that Marion's three really worked for her. I thought that Hannah's was very playful, but a lot of work to do there. Now we get to see Travis Rice and Torstein Horgmo, the two men who sparred with the best score of the day yesterday, finally going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Two runs of one-upmanship. They provided, without question, the best backcountry freestyle snowboarding ever witnessed yesterday. Conditions maybe not quite as prime, but... Just count out the numbers. I don't think this is going to be uh, in any way a step down from the level we saw yesterday when you look at what these two are capable of. Oh, completely. And they've been kind of like yelling at each other across the way this entire competition so far. And now, finally, they meet head to head. OK, so Travis heading off, rider's right, over this big bowling ball. Looking confident as ever. He knows exactly where he is, doesn't he? Yeah. Lovely turn up there. and He's got great snow on this side. Backside 180. <laughs> and then he's riding this better than most people can ride it forward. <laughs> So what's he setting up for? Cab five. <laughs> Cab five. Holds on to it. That's that T-Rise golden orca tail working for him. The lightest touchdown on a lofty backflip. He knows exactly where he is and he's measured his features perfectly, hasn't he? He knows the scale. Great method right there. I mean, that's a fantastic trilogy of tricks right now to start this off. 
Right, really chundry there. You can see there's been a lot of heat radiation off that rock face that had melted that snow. So he's dealing with that. Looks like he's anticipated it. And he's looking for the shaded side of this spine now to pop that back three into. Very, very tidy again. You get the feeling, I mean, we've talked about this. Travis Rice didn't get to come to Alaska in 2021. And it's almost like he's been plotting like some kind of Bond villain for the last year on how to get back here and what he's going to do when he gets here. No, completely. I mean, he is such an analytical rider. I mean, Tora is also, but you can't help but think that he has spent a lot of time playing this in his mind's eye leading up to this date. Okay. Wow. So Travis Rice, a very, very strong first run score. Oh, that hits so many. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So, Gold Norka gets chucked in and Travis takes front row seats to watch his fellow finalist, Torstein Horgmo, come down Spinal Tap. And this is a little bit of a poke the bear situation because both of these riders respond to that up-leveling of the playing field. Of course, we can also see the light starting to deteriorate just a yeah, little yeah. bit with the first kind of inklings of that storm from the west coming in. Yeah, the definition of those shadows is definitely waning, yeah, isn't it? So, Torstein Horgmo knows exactly where he's going. And, and you said it, it's poking the bear. Like, these are two riders who aren't going to get intimidated by a good run. It's only going to fire the other one up. And Torstein attacking this face now. For the first time, he's coming in with proper pace. Yeah, that was a heck of an entry into this finals match. Going frontside 180 into cab oh, five. What a combo. And that is literally tick number one in the judges' handbook. Controls the speed there with a tiny bobble, but it's only small. Frontside air. Yeah, that is going to bode so well. Like you said, coming in with so much power into that combination. OK, he's got a whopping great feature down here. Skirting around the side of it. You can hear that on his, he's riding with a radio mic. You can hear there's a little bit of crust on that sunny side. Oh! Oh, and he's taken, taken that one like a champ. That was a body blow, wasn't it? Right to the ribs. You know, he is not gonna be stoked on that right now because right now there is no room for error. Well, you saw the run that Travis has laid down. Yeah. And, and the, to be fair, the bar he set for himself yesterday with that 97. Oh, completely. I mean, there's still an entire another run, but you have to be thinking, he's like, okay, now it's up to my second go. I tell you what, when you see it like this, when the mojo slipped and the run is starting to fray, you realize just how immense their performances are when it's going right. Yes, completely. Like, you saw him there, he's just kind of like, oh, am I on my toes? Am I falling away off this? What's going on? You lose your mojo, and then they put down seven tricks in a row at the highest level, so, so technical. What we've talked about throughout this is that with this kind of terrain, with these spines and these feature-laden faces, you can't really afford to to make bobbles that are going to upset the next thing you're going to hit. So it really is just an added layer to the momentum. OK, so Torstein Hormo breathing heavily as he makes his way down there. Travis Rice definitely had the best of the light up at the top there. But let's not take anything away from him. It was a monstrous start. I mean, look at how far down the run he goes right there. That was just enormous. Held on to it. Then he got that back flip in. The backside 360. I mean, that takeoff and the landing was immaculate. Two methods in this run, of course, also just showing some proper style. And then Torstein coming in super hot on his run and then going front one into a cab five. That was just an awesome start up to the top. And so technical. He's got so little setup time on that takeoff. Beautiful. That landing was great, too. He made it look so deceptively easy. Yeah. But then just carrying so much speed. I mean, most of the time you'd say in Alaska, speed is your friend, but 
with the light this milky and knowing that that sunny side of the spine was probably going to be like second rate snow I got off the plane. difficult decision that upper section was insane thank you nice work oh my god so Ooh. travis is daring to did dream did you get at this hung stage. up on the backside yeah. i just my edge just went right into the crust damn it and then it was too flat to go because you were you were trying to go for that yeah the end of it yeah i would try to just get the end but i was trying to haul ass and it it just got crusted yeah so that sunny side of the face yeah. really yeah. starting to unstick some riders although you've got to give it to travis he negotiated the same area where that wall of rock where there was so much heat radiation 85 for Travis, 60 for Six Torstein. Travis is in the driving seat after the first the upper, run. Upper part was money, dude. Nice work. Thank you. Yeah, I just couldn't. Yeah. yeah. Let's get let's get it again. Get it while the light's holding. Looks like it's starting to slip. You heard it from the man himself. Have to get it in before the light runs out. Yeah. Bit of time pressure on these runs now. Hannah Beeman back up at the top of Spinal Tap. So third place in Alaska. She's already bested that this year. Can she take the win though? Well, I think, as we said before, we only saw Hannah in like a third gear. So surely, even though the light is deteriorating, she's going to be looking to turn that up a notch to depress the gas pedal even more. Yeah, you really hope for her sake that it's not a case of what might have been, that she squandered the good light on that first run, but she opened the face to her credit. She had no, nothing to go on from the snow from previous riders. Totally, and it was a solid line in itself, so. Okay, Hannah Beeman coming directly into this shoot. Oh no, she's pulling a little bit riders left of where she came in last time. Right on top oh, of wow. this exposure. And, oh man, that was awesome. Just dropping that massive rock cliff right there. So clean, showing her experience there. And then arcing out a couple of big turns up onto this spine again. So, revisiting this line. You can hear her pep talking all the way down. difficult for us to pull out the visibility so when you're right on top of that snow it's even harder she needs something down here uh, front, front side, side three yes so we just don't <laughs> both very excited that's what she needed to be able to up level her run from before and there's still plenty of run left really nice solid drop there got a decent grab on it Linking up onto this. And visibility really at a premium here. That's where Marion put her three in. Just skipped over that. You can see her just having to pull back a little of speed on that hit, I'm sure, because of that visibility. On riding by feel there. You can almost see the way, like the body language through her arms and her hands. You can tell when she's a little bit blind and it felt like she was just reading the snow, reading what the board was doing to take that through and just looking for the bigger features. Nice stale fish transfer at the bottom there. And another really strong run from Hannah Beeman. Especially considering like how milky that looks here on the screen. I cannot imagine just trying to see those nuances and terrain from her point of view. On the bottom is scary because you can't see. There you have it, confirming exactly what you just said, Mary. So Hannah Beeman riding by touch at the bottom of that face. And Marion Haerty, I'm sure will know that that run was strong. She looks pretty relaxed up there though. I mean, she is no stranger to consequential terrain in a variety of conditions. She's she's ridden massive mountains in so many different kinds of weather. I watched her riding in Haines at the Freeride World Tour in 2017. The snow was like thigh deep and there was a lot of exposure on that face. So she's, for her, this is scaling it back. This is a playful face for her. 
That's a really, really good point. But, yeah, she needs... She's she's far from home and dry here. She did lead off that first run, but Hunter's got that 360. I'm further up the face too, so higher risk. Yes, that's a, that's a great point that we haven't mentioned before, is because if she hadn't landed that, that could have disrupted so much more of the run for her. So, great point. Okay, and Marion looking for something new here. This is exactly where we saw Torstein Horgmo with that front one. So a little drop, she's doubling this one up. Front three. Oh. Really solid strategy though there. That's what you need to do right now. Uh, yeah, she knew that if she wants to put pressure on Hannah, she's got to throw something big further up the face. She's got great snow on this side of the spine and she's got some definition up there. Getting a method across the spine right there. out these turns she needs something else in here if she wants to push this she's got to take a risk it doesn't look like she's got the visibility to do that she didn't have the confidence in how steeply this this side of the spine was dropping away although she lined up a cliff front side air off of that oh I you know what, this is gonna be very, very close, I think. She's, and we know that Hannah struggled down here with visibility. It's quite milky at the bottom of the face. I can see her losing a little bit off that, just for that reason, surely. So, Hannah Beeman crowbarred her way back into this final with a very, very solid second run. And Marion Haerty not convincingly defending that lead that she earned on the first run with her second. This one's going to come down to the wire. The judges have got some very tough decisions to make here. I completely agree. This, this is a really, really close, close matchup. How's that light? Kind of uh, not great, huh? But with the wind uh, in the shadow, I didn't see anything. Yeah, the wind's picking wind, up. Wind, no light. Yeah. Okay, well, let's take a look at these second runs. Hannah Beeman, against the odds, putting down a very, very solid run. You called it, Mary, a lot of exposure up at the top here. And that is strategic, too, that she put her, her hits at the top of the run where the light was significantly stronger and was easier to see the landing and really touch down. And up at the top of the run, like, you've got that big cliff drop, then you've got the front three all in the top half of the run, and that's just going to max out the risk category. And of course, on Marion's side, she has the lead from run number one, but no doubt that she wants to improve on that score because there's no safety sitting there with Hana. And I, I respected that a lot in Marion's run. Like, there's real ambition going for that double with the drop straight. Like, we know it was tough for Torstein there getting that cab five out. And it's the same, you have no setup time for that front three. She did really well to put it down. I completely agree. Just couldn't ride out. So, the body language said it all from Marion. Now, comes down to this judge's decision. Marion leads after run one. National selection tour 2022 Alaska is Honda Beeman with a score of 90 on <gasps> Wow, an improvement for Marion Haerty with that risk up at the top. But I think that is a reflection exactly as we said, Mary, of fresh tracks off that big drop up at the top and then higher risk category with that front three. A very, very well-deserved victory for Honda Beeman. Hannah brought it up herself. She wanted to raise the bar from her performance last year in AK, and she has surely done it. She is now the champion of this Alaska final stop. And it's always a big, big testament to a rider's skill and experience that they can do it in any conditions. So Travis Rice leads into the second runs. I'm going to try this. I might just abort my run. OK. Like, He's going to try it. Down. What, what is he going to try, though? That's the big question on everyone's lips right now. Only one man has the answer. And at the moment, he's got one hand on the natural selection Alaska trophy. You know, try. He might also have a couple of fingers on the overall Into natural the selection tour title. And at 39, that would make an old man very, very happy. And you can see now, even up at top, those that cloud-covered flat light is really, really coming in. I mean, we can barely see the, the terrain nuances right now. Yeah, and you can see it in Travis's body language too. Little butter along the top of the spine there. Very little definition to play with here. 
And that, that roll just came up on you, didn't it? You saw Travis almost holding his hands up like, whoa, where am I going? I mean, this is a massive challenge, especially for Torstein. Oh, really having no <laughs> issue with that back three. Oh, but there you go. That's where not being able to see the definition of the of the terrain. Yeah, that came out of nowhere. You. Yeah. Like, we had no idea. I couldn't see that. There's no way that Travis can see that. And of course, for Torstein going second, usually a position of advantage. But with yeah. the worsening light conditions, I mean, what opportunity does he have to now try to regain that lead? Yeah, Travis, walking it out at the bottom there. I don't know, I couldn't see anything. It's like freaking ping pong ball. I mean, such a big part of the Natural Selection Tour is navigating and dancing with Mother Nature and the whims that she throws at you, i.e. an incoming front. And it's it's so disappointing to have seen the way these riders rode yesterday, like literally tit for tat with some of the best snowboarding anyone ever has ever witnessed. But Torstein Horgmo most certainly up against it. He's got one run here, but with fading light, a storm front making I its way. And you can see it. the horizon just behind him there. The cloud making its oh, way over those ridges. You just heard him say that he, he has no visibility right now. So Torstein Horgmo sets off down Spinal Tap, the last man to drop today. And he's, you, you haven't even got enough. Like you think about this gradient. It's so, so steep on the way into this face. He did so well to control that. You've got no, no navigation, no navigational sense to know when that ground is coming up toward you, where the, where the terrain changes. Like that is so challenging. You can't see like change in snow. And you can see, I always use hands and arms as great barometers of style and confidence. And you could see Torsteins were up high. He had no idea what was coming at him. He was trying to get his body ready for anything unexpected. Oh my God. So second runs are scratched, <laughs> which means it was one and done for Travis Rice. That was the worst run ever. Wow. I couldn't see shit. <laughs> that was so terrifying. Yeah, an Alaskan face blind. An Alaskan face in itself is intimidating uh, enough, but uh, blind. This year's natural selection stop, Alaska, is Travis Rice with a score of 85 on his first run. There you have it. Yeah. Age 39, <laughs> Travis Rice takes out the Yeti natural selection, Alaska. Yeah. A true pleasure. We 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 Respect. bled to get into the final. Respect. Um, that was a treat. Goddamn treat. <laughs> oh, that was a heartbreak. We we got iced out. We're just dancing on the great stage of Mother Nature. And sometime <laughs> she says, "You've had enough." And today we most <laughs> certainly have. Storms rolling in very quickly, so everyone must get off the glacier. But very fittingly. Travis Rice, a Yeti ambassador, takes out the Yeti natural selection here in Alaska. We're going to go for a quick break now, but when we come back, we'll have prize givings and the overall titles. And as you saw, that second run score for Ben Ferguson, a 90. So he's kind of got room to play here but he wants to put as much distance as he can between himself uh, and Raspin, so he's only gonna try and up it. Which, I mean, beautiful improvement on it right there. Little washout, but he's still got control. I wanna point out too, the gullies, the runnels of these are compromised snow. The snow's not as good in the gullies here. Why is that, Travis? Well, you know, it's a different approach than, say, you take in the Rocky Mountains, where here, up on the ridges, like you just saw, oh, been really psyched on stomping the three off the top there. Um, the snow stays soft. It isn't disrupted on the ridges, where the gullies constantly has sloughing, and wind almost hits the gullies a little harder. So more compromised snow in the gullies. Welcome back to the Yeti Natural Selection here in the Alaskan backcountry. 
What an event we have just witnessed. Travis Rice and Hannah Beeman taking out the event titles. We're gonna find out very shortly who's taken out the overall titles as well. But this was everyone packing up on the glacier. Those who could leave the night before finals did. So they got out as quickly as possible to lighten the load for finals day because that storm system came in so quickly. Right now though, with Mark McMorris, Mikel Bang, Ben Ferguson and Zoe sadowski Sinop, you can take a look at this event through the eyes of the Burton Riders. I love camping. So a little glimpse of Alaska Resort there. About 45 minutes southeast of Anchorage, it's the biggest resort in the state of Alaska. And I mean, it's got some fantastic terrain there. And while everyone was there, this is where everyone based out of when they weren't at the base camp on the glacier. You can see the gorgeous accommodations, a bit of a far cry from Tent Village that they were living in. Um, but the riders really got great snow while at Alaska. Yeah, that same storm that shut the event down at the start that delivered the 60 centimeters or two feet of fresh up to the glacier also snowed down here. So the riders had a chance to really tear into it. And I know for a fact that the, there's a section of trees just above the resort itself that were on the cards to host either a supernatural or an ultra natural event. Really good gradient, really good trees. And you can see the quality of the snow here. And that's what was so cool about being based in this area for the third stop of the tour, was that on down days, you had this entire resort to rip around instead of just kind of waiting for the weather to come in. Yeah, and then when that high pressure does arrive, they can ship out under an hour in the otters and the beaver planes and jump out onto the glacier. Okay, let's take a look now though at the best run of the day. Who do you think it was? You know, I have an inkling it might be the man behind it all. Travis Rice. And here we're looking at Travis's run from semifinals. And what a run it was. This was, bar none, one of the best Alaskan snowboarding runs we have ever seen. The tranny finder on that cab five. He gets perfectly onto the back of that little knoll there. And then the front five, look at his shoulder position as he comes to 450. If you watch here, he's got the grab, comes around and then he starts to counter rotate his shoulders here to kill that rotation meets it perfectly. That run was the culmination of the ethos of this event. And then the cab three to little bounce back. From top to bottom, the intensity of this run, he's got, like, it's not an easy face. Like there's serious gradient and exposure to deal with, but he's treating it like a snow park. Absolutely blowing minds. Now it's time to take a look at the winning runs. This is Hannah Beeman's second run. She went against the odds in that flat light and really delivered. This is 
you know, really showcasing Hana's, the depth of her ability as such a strong and talented rider, being able not only to navigate the terrain on this run, but also the fading light. I think strategizing and putting down two big tricks at the top of her run really elevated her score. And then Travis, it, yes, it scaled back from yesterday, but still, this is, it's a phenomenal setup. Just that beautiful, like, backside 180 into these switch turns, and he finds that beautiful diving board, big cab five. I mean, he just looks so comfortable on this terrain. And it, well, it's a mark of how much experience he's got up here. And the fact that he was going up against Torstein, Back three. He's able to adjust his rotations in those moments before he takes off, whether he wants to cork something a little more, a little less, depending on what the landing looks like. I think that's his ability to read terrain and then adjust in a second is what makes him such an incredible rider yes. in Alaska. It's totally remarkable. Okay. Once everyone had evacuated off the glacier, it was time to crack the Pacificos and hand out the silverware. And for that, we hand you over to our man in Alaska. It's none other than Tom Monterosso. Thanks, guys. Well, the 2022 Yeti Natural Selection Alaska is officially a wrap. However, the fun is just getting started here at Alaska Resort as we're going to get into awards top three women top three men, we're also going to crown an overall tour title champion in the men's and women's field. But first, we're going to get into the Quicksilver Surf the Mountain Award. This award goes to the rider who attacked the slope with poise, fluidity, and power. And in turn, they're going to take home a custom MR surfboard. It's going to be insane. That rider, chosen by the judges, is none other than Ben Ferguson. It's a bad day to be the Pacific Ocean, I'll tell you that. Good job. around out there on this thing next summer. <laughs> All right, now we are going to get into the Women's Awards. Top three out there in the Tordrillo range. It was prime Alaska conditions. It was absolutely insane. One of the most monumental days in snowboard history. Starting things off in third place from Wanaka, New Zealand, Zoe Sadowski Sinat. And then in second place from Chamonix, France, Marion Herdy. And then at the end of an epic day in the Tords, the women's champion, her first natural selection win, Hannah Beeman. All right, let's give one more round of applause for all the gals who rode out there in the tours. It was an epic, epic day. Congratulations. And now we are going to get into the men's top three. It was an unbelievable battle. Eight dudes, three came out on top. In third place, you just saw him win a custom MR surfboard from Bend, Oregon, Mr. Ben Ferguson. And then it came down to a head-to-head -head battle between two of our sport's most prolific icons. In second place, coming out of Trondheim, Norway, Mr. Torstein Horgmo. And then in true fashion, our champion literally did exactly what he does best. 
the one, the only, the AK champion, Mr. Travis Rice. Those are your top three men and top three women here at the 2022 Yeti Natural Selection Alaska. For the first time ever, seeing as this is a three-stop tour, we are now going to crown your men's and women's overall Natural Selection Tour champions. Starting with the gals, this girl rode absolutely incredible. She won in Jackson, got second place in Baldface, and took fourth place up here in the Alaskan backcountry. Give it up for your women's overall tour champion, Elena Height. Well, it's official. Elena Height is your overall women's natural selection tour champion. Now on to the men. This fine fella got seventh place in Jackson Hole, his home turf, third place in Baldface, and took an absolutely commanding win here in Alaska. He does what he does. He's one of the best of all time, Mr. Travis Rice. Yeah. Thank you. This is incredible. Mathematically did not see this happening. A lot of unique variables had to happen and some some of the best who were looked like to be on complete rhythm and in sync had to had to misstep for this to even happen. So yeah, um, this is incredible. Yeah. Woo! Thanks, Jeff. As the Yeti Natural Selection up here in Alaska does come to a conclusion, that does wrap up our three-stop Natural Selection Tour. For the first time ever, we were able to crown men's and women's tour champions. We had stops in Jackson Hole. We had a stop in Baldface, and we had a stop in the Alaskan backcountry. We can't thank you all enough for coming on this journey with us. Please stay tuned as we continue to push this thing that we all love. Thank you for tuning in. Stay stoked. Stay hyped. We will see you next winter. So Travis Rice claims not just the Alaskan event, but also the Natural Selection Tour title. It's phenomenal achievement for him when you look at the caliber of rider he's up against. Oh, completely. And so humble in the face of it all, giving accolades to his competitors, saying that missteps had to happen. But honestly, he had the highest score. He pushed riding to new heights in Alaska, along with his peers during this competition. And then for Hannah Beeman, you got quite emotional about this one, Mary. Hannah has such an enduring legacy in snowboarding, and this is just further proof positive of how much impact she continually has. And then on the same side for Elena, who left a very successful career in halfpipe to break trail in the backcountry, this is a tangible representation that she is only building even further on another incredibly impactful part of her career. And then we should mention as well, Jared Elston, 23 years old, making a name for himself on the tour this year. That's a real inspiration to younger riders who are looking at natural selection and thinking, this is how I want to forge my career. I mean, last year, natural selection created a paradigm shift and this year built on that momentum so heavily. Where do we go from here? I have absolutely no idea, but I can't wait to find out. Thank you for joining us. I think you'll agree it has been a breathtaking event up here in Alaska. We'll see you next year.
on the Natural Selection Tour.